Council meeting on January 9th at 6 p.m. and it's a little different. We've got we'll have a kind of an introductory piece, and then we're going to conduct a little bit of business around some of the appointments, and then we will start the conversation on Piper Shore. So with that, um, it's a call to order, and I don't know we don't really need to take roll call. I don't think and pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> so with that, um, I think the, the first order of business, uh, we, the Appointments Committee, Don, I think you are going to read the names. We met this week and you have some results from that. So thanks, thank thanks very much. Before I read the names, I want to just to give a little background. Um, and first of all, thank uh, everyone who served and will serve in the town council and other committees. Uh, your work is invaluable. Uh, we're pleased to announce appointments this evening for posting and approval that will take place and be finalized, uh, I think, the, the next uh, town council meeting. The Appointments and Negotiations Committee, committee Peter, Jean, Marie, uh, Todi, and I, along with town clerk staff, Tracy, worked diligently to expedite a number of these appointments. So we're starting the year mainly because of the calendar effect with 50 vacancies at the outset. Uh, majority uh, of these uh, we're going to try to fill in the next several weeks. Um, they include full voting member roles as well as alternate roles. So I wanted to thank everybody who's made this a priority early in the year, which has um, proven to be pretty busy. Uh, there are a number of applicants who were not placed in the first round, so we're hopeful we'll be able to get them placed in uh, other assignments. Um, we have some process issues. Uh, uh, There's no surprise. Uh, so please bear with us as we try to streamline the process and make it more effective and responsive for everybody. So um, um, we've identified candidates for about 35 positions, and we'll be uh, recommending most of those appointments this evening. Uh, we'll iterate this process until uh, you know we get the positions filled, and we're going to try to target to have 100% of the, the positions on our committees staffed uh, as, as early as we can this year. Uh, close to 80% of the positions that we're filling uh, are thanks to people who have agreed to continue service. So uh, special thanks to those people. Um, we've posted vacancies on the town website. We're going to add a page on local TV as well as a Facebook site and a news feed on the web. So I'd also, word of mouth is very uh, helpful. So if you could please spread the word to 
to friends and family who might have an interest in, in serving the town. So with that, I'd like to make the following um, recommendations for appointments. Um, Board of Assessment Review, reappoint Matt Chamberlain and Melinda Torrens as full voting members with terms to expire in 2021. There are two vacancies remaining on this board, one alternate expiring 2021 and a second alternate 2019. Cable Television Committee, we're going to reappoint uh, Art Dillon as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. There are two vacancies remaining on this committee, a first alternate expiring in 2021 and a second alternate expiring 2021. So apologies, it's going to be a little bit like reading from a cereal box here, so upon, sorry, sorry for it, uh, me droning on. But Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee reappointing Calvin Bailey and Maria Odlin as full voting members with terms to expire in 2021, and we're appointing Michael Slavin as first alternate with a term to expire also in 2021. One vacancy remains on this committee, Coastal Waters and Harbor, uh, second alternate expiring 2020. Community Services and Recreation Advisory Board, we're going to be reappointing uh, Richard Murphy as a full voting member. Uh, his term expires 2021, and appointing a second alternate with a term to expire 2021 as a vacancy. Conservation Commission, reappointing Rachel Hendrickson as full voting member with term to expire in 2021. There will be one vacancy remaining on this commission, a full voting member role uh, expiring 2021. Energy Committee, we're going to reappoint Rick Meinkin and David Kirstein as full voting members and Ronald Allen as first alternate. All terms will expire in 2021. There will be one vacancy left on this committee, a second alternate expiring in 2020. Uh, Historic Preservation and Implementation Committee, uh, uh, by a special meeting, we've appointed Will Rowan as a full voting member to fill a term to expire in 2019. Um, with this appointment, the board is full. Uh, and special thanks to Craig Friedrich, who reminded us about, uh, about this. Housing Alliance, uh, reappoint Eric Boucher and Deborah Grew as full voting members with terms to expire in 2021, and also appoint Will Rowan as full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. Uh, interesting to note that Will Rowan was the uh, town council liaison on the Housing Alliance previously. There is one vacancy left on the Alliance, a full voting member role 20. 19 expiration. Uh, Long Range Planning Committee, we're reappointing Judy Roy as first alternate and Corey Fellows as second alternate with terms to expire in 2021. Uh, with these reappointments, this committee is full. Parks and Conservation Land Board, reappointing Rachel Hendrickson as full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. There is one vacancy on this board of full voting member 2021 expiration. Personnel Appeals Board, reappointing Jay Anton Bodor as full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. We move, Art Dillon will move from a first alternate into a full voting position with term to expire 2019. Two vacancies are remaining on this board, a first alternate expiring 2021 and a second alternate expiring 2020. Senior Advisory Board, reappointing Carol Spencer as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021 and appointing a new full voting member, Erica Jordan, with a term to expire in 2021. There are two vacancies remaining on this board, a first alternate expiring 2020 and a second alternate 2021. Shellfish Conservation Commission reappointing Paul Erickson as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021, and Nathan Orff will move from first alternate to a full member with a term to expire in 2020, and appointing Matthew Hassler as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2021. One vacancy remains on this commission, first alternate expiring 2019. And Zoning Board of Appeals, Z, we're near the end here, reappointing Karen Shoup as a full voting member with term to expire in 2021 and appointing David Burke as a full voting member with term to expire 2021. There are two vacancies remaining on this board, first alternate 2021 and second alternate 2020 expiration dates. And that, that concludes our first pass at uh, recommendations for appointments to committees. Thank you. Assume that was you offered in the motion. Do you want to talk about the pending? Uh, I didn't yeah. think we were. I would. Uh, we have pending. Just, uh, just the process for that. Yeah, okay. from the process standpoint, we have pending um, decisions for planning board. 
Scarborough Economic Development Board and Transportation Committee, potentially. So, uh, and, and we'll share details with you on those when we have uh, what would amount to, I suppose, a first reading or first posting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So a motion to approve those, Slate? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And thank you, Diana. That was a lot of work to kind of do that in a short period of time. So thank you. Lobby. Thank you. New lobby. <laughs> um, we're about to transition into some, a public comment section, but before we do that, I just want to kind of have two announcements. One, kind of, you'll probably notice that two council members are not here this evening. We knew they weren't going to be here. One is on vacation someplace warm and sunny. <laughs> um, the other council member, Councillor Babine, as you know, is in Augusta in the House of Representatives, and he is on a bus somewhere in northern Maine doing a three-day tour. So, <laughs> so those two are not here tonight, but we knew that in advance, but thought it was important to have this conversation. Second announcement would be, I notice we have a Boy Scout with us tonight. I don't know if you would like to stand up and tell us a little <laughs> 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 right. well, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your interest. <laughs> um, and I think at this, at this point, what we're going to do, I think the town manager has some comments, but we're going to open it up to public comment. I think we will be here for that conversation. After that, we'll segue into some comments from Piper Shores, and then we will convene as both bodies, the, the planning board and the town council, to have a conversation. So, Tom, I think you had yeah, some. For lack of a better place to make the comments, I'll do them, do them now very quickly in terms of process. Uh, tonight we are together uh, now in a workshop uh, mode, if you will. Uh, really, in, from my perspective, uh, information gathering. Uh, uniquely, the contract zone process uh, has elements that involves the planning board and the town council. And I think it's important to maybe talk about the different roles and responsibilities of those respective boards in this process. Um, in this context, an amendment to a contract zone, the planning board is really the technical resource uh, and is reviewing the plan for its on its technical merits against the site plan standards. Um, there are a number of policy-related matters that really are within the responsibility of the council. What sort of relief is being sought? what sort of conditions might be associated with the approval that would make the project acceptable. Um, and to help guide those discussions, uh, I've suggested the agenda is formatted such that when the council uh, convenes with the planning board around the table a little later, uh, they focus on a couple of threshold questions that really should prompt some, some meaty discussion. And those really are, uh, is the proposal consistent with the comprehensive plan, which is a real important uh, finding that needs to be made by the council. And secondly, uh, what is the, uh, what's the public benefit associated with the proposal? Uh, both of those are key elements of any contract zone uh, proposal. And frankly, this body has not had uh, an opportunity to really have a substantive conversation around that. And so the planning board is invited, I think, to be part of that conversation and to be a resource uh, as the council uh, continues with that. Uh, so from a format and agenda point of view for tonight, as Council Chair Hayes mentioned, uh, we're looking at taking public comment first. Uh, we have asked Piper Shores to uh, provide a short presentation focused on three primary areas. One, advise uh, all of those assembled here what sorts of things have changed on their plan from the original submission. Um, secondly, from their perspective, how is their proposal consistent with the comprehensive plan? And thirdly, uh, the public benefit aspects of the proposal. Uh, and I've had some conversations with them. Uh, they've got a team of consultants that will be helping in this process. Um, so with that, I think we're ready for public comment. And I think it is easier for you to stay at your desk for public comment and maybe even a presentation, and then we can adjourn. And then I think the only other thing I'd add, we, we, I'm sure we have a fair number of people tonight that might be interested in, in having some comments. We, we kind of have a, a rule over kind of a guideline of about three minutes um, so everybody gets a chance to speak. So with that, anybody that's interested in starting the conversation, we ask you to just come to the podium and give us your name and address and make your comments if you would, please. Good evening. My name is Bob Dulac. I live at Six Newcomb Ridge. I'm one of the abutters. Um, I'm going to read a letter that we sent to the town council and the planning board the first of the year uh, from Newcomb Ridge, just so that the public can hear it. Um, 
So I'm going to start with, we are writing at the start of 2019 to restate our continued opposition to the Piper Shore Dorado Drive project. We ask both the Town Council and the Planning Board to deny the application unequivocally where it is not compliant with the contract zoning section of the zoning ordinance with, with the current RF zoning district nor the Town of Scarborough Comprehensive Plan. Let us be clear, we do not have a sense of entitlement to the Dorado property in its present views. The current landowner has every right to sell the property, sell and develop the property. With that said, we ask that they follow the rules required within the RF zone and adhere to the town's comprehensive plan. The Dorado parcel consists of 46 acres and the mass is very clear. 46 acres divided by the two acre minimum would equate to 23 single family residential lots. With further consideration of wetlands and other potential obstacles, we suspect the actual buildable outcome would be closer to 18. Certainly this is a far cry from the 62 unit project being proposed by Piper Shores. The comprehensive plan states, and I quote, Scarborough has rural zoning districts with two acre minimum lot requirements hoping to conserve the natural qualities of the rural open space. The purpose of, this, of these districts is to lower the overall population density and protect environmentally sensitive areas as well as maintain larger tracts of land for resource use but allow development and flexibility. The Drado Drive property is clearly in the comprehensive plan's limited growth sector where the town desires to see little development but which is subject to development under current zoning. Piper Shores proposal is clearly inconsistent with the limited growth sector. We as Newcomb Ridge residents struggled as to how the town of Scarborough approved the original Piper Shores back in 1997. It never should have happened then and no way should have happened on, happen on Dorado Drive now. The contract zone change must remain consistent with the town towns of Scarborough comprehensive plan and compatible with the existing permitted use within the zoning district's clarification. Piper Shores clearly does not meet any of the required criteria. As we examine all other contract zones within Scarborough, it is clear that all non-Piper Zone contract zones are consistent with the com comprehensive plan and compatible with the pre-existing zoning districts for their permitted use. We see no reason why Piper Shores should get a free pass to bypass the zoning ordinance in the comprehensive plan. You may recall it was said at the first reading regarding the Piper Shores proposal the, at June 20, 2018 Scarborough Town Council meeting and we quote, the two subdivisions that run astride the proposed development seem to be on board with it. I think that's very important because we are placing higher density than the current zoning allows." Unquote. On the contrary, we, we the Newcomb Ridge residents emphatically say that we are no way on board with the Piper Shores proposal. We are on board with playing by the rules. As Newcomb Ridge residents of this town and citizens of this town, we respectfully insist the town of Scarborough follow its own set of rules and protect us from this out of character sized development and divide deny Piper Shores application completely, adhere to the requirements of the current RF zone, zoning ordinance and stay the course of the town's comprehensive plan. The town of Scarborough was built on the existing classifications that allow, zoning classifications that allow responsible development which we all support and have relied upon. Sincerely, the residents of Newcomb Ridge. I thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Mary Dulek and my husband Bob, who just spoke, and I live at 6 Newcomb Ridge, which is directly across from the pocket neighborhood portion of the proposed Piper Shores expansion project. First, I would like to thank everyone for your work and service to the community of Scarborough, and I appreciate the opportunity to address both boards tonight. My husband Bob and I are here because of our opposition to the proposed Piper Shores expansion on Dorado Drive and the request to change from the current RF zone to a contract zone. We would like to be clear, our issue is not with Piper Shores. My mom enjoyed living several years at Piper Shores and it was a very positive experience. We would be standing here no matter which institution was asking to build a dense housing complex and requesting this zoning change. Our issue is not with the current Dorado Drive landowner. We have enjoyed living across from this land and its natural beauty, but it is in his right to sell the R of zone property. Our issue is with the town of Scarborough and the potential zoning change before us tonight. Bob and I have lived in neighboring Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough for most of our lives, 
and we've spent many years enjoying this beautiful area along Route 77, Higgins, and the surroundings. After raising our sons in Cape Elizabeth in a family neighborhood with housing lots in very close proximity, we wanted to live in a more private and less dense property, but still with close proximity to the beaches and on this beautiful stretch of Spurlink Road. When we found our current home on Newcomb Ridge, we did our homework, learning that the land across from our front yard, referred to as the Dorado property, was in the RF zone classification. We felt assured that if it was ever sold and developed, we knew that the residential lots would be at least two acres in size. The privacy, sense of serenity, surrounding nature, and RF zone checked our boxes, and we have thoroughly enjoyed living on Newcomb Ridge and in Scarborough for about 11 years now. I am speaking tonight to ask the members of the planning board and the town council, envision yourselves from our perspective, amending the Dorado property to a contract zone and allowing Piper Shores to expand and develop their facility is in no way in character of the surrounding area and rural farming zone that we rely upon as property owners on Newcomb Ridge. I am sure with this viewpoint, you would also be in opposition to the zoning change in a complex comprised of in addition to the areas of single and duplex housing, a 24-unit apartment complex, dining hall parking, and access roads. We implore the town council and planning boards to do what's right and stand up for the integrity of the zoning regulations in order to maintain the character of this RF zone as well as other RF zone areas in Scarborough that property owners rely upon. Thank you very much for your time, your consideration, and your support. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Tim Yeomans. I uh, live on Newcomb Ridge, 10 Newcomb Ridge Road, along with my wife, Lori, who's here. Um, first in the agenda that was published tonight, um, numbered page three, uh, the contract zoning local authorization slide. I'd just like to point out that the public benefit required that's listed on that slide is not really part of the, of the authorization section. Uh, slide one or number slide two, rather, that's titled Contract Zoning and Comprehensive Plan, that is the entirety of authorization in the zoning ordinance. Uh, and I'd like to talk about that right now, what the authority is of the town council here, especially as it applies to the Dorado Drive proposal from Piper Shores. Um, the town council uh, is authorized to do contract zoning, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, exercising its sole and exclusive judgment as the legislative body of the town of Scarborough. Um, but to, for, for use, to allow reasonable uses of the land, which would not be, have been permitted by the existing don't zoning district, but, and that's an important word, which remain consistent with the Town of Scarborough Comprehensive Plan and compatible with the existing and permitted uses within the existing zoning district classification. So contrary to what the town manager said, there's actually two requirements that are co-equal in the authority section of the zoning ordinance. One is consistency with the Town of Scarborough Comprehensive Plan, and the second co-equal separate requirement is compatibility with the existing zone. In this context, we're talking about the limited growth sector, as Bob Dulac just pointed out, consistent with the limited growth sector of the Town of Scarborough Comprehensive Plan, and compatible with the RF zone. Before, those two things both need to be required before you even get to public benefit, by my reading of the, um, of the zoning ordinance. I'd like to now refer to uh, numbered page four in the agenda tonight, tab one, which is uh, Piper Shore's uh, memo to the town council of December 21st via Sebago Technics. At the bottom of page one of that letter, uh, they talk about responses to public comments at the November 19th, uh, 2018 planning board meeting. Uh, their responses that they list are actually non-responsive. They, they, they just omit conveniently for their own purposes any comments that all the Newcomb Ridge residents made about what we've been talking about, the RF zone and the limited growth sector of the comprehensive plan, compatibility and consistency. I'd like to then take the... Uh, uh, the council's attention to numbered page 20, uh, tab 3, in the uh, agenda for this evening. The first page of, of 
Piper Shore's Second Amendment to Contract Zoning Agreement, the second whereas clause, the Piper Shores is asserting that the town council has already determined that uh, this is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Obviously, that has not occurred yet. Um, Piper Shores justifies their assertion by saying that it's consistent with the comprehensive plan, comprehensive plan because it provides a range of senior housing uh, within a growth area served by um, public water. It provides jobs. Uh, it's a nonprofit business. Um, none of these relate to the limited growth sector. Then at the end of that paragraph, Piper Shores just makes the assertion, it's consistent with the existing zone, but they make no justification whatsoever. So uh, I could make other points about this. I would just like to say in, in closing and in summary that Piper Shores has made no credible case at all that the Dorado Drive proposed project is consistent with the limited growth sector and the comprehensive plan nor that it is compatible with the permitted uses of the RF zone, we ask the town council to find this incompatibility and this inconsistency that, is, is, uh, that their authority is limited by. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. I'm not a speaker really, but my name is Don Simino. I live on Newcomb Ridge, number four Newcomb Ridge. Been there for 45 years. Uh, my wife's been in the area for almost 65 years. Uh, we stay mostly because of privacy of this location, mostly because it is protected in the RF zone. We never oppose Wildwood, Stone Ridge, Acorn Lane. We, they were within the RF zone. No problem. Along comes Piper Shores. We were opposed to the original plan for that contract zone. Um, and at that time, they stated, this is all we want. This is, we're not going to go any more than this. We're asking for the whole pie here. And uh, you've seen that they've expanded three times that I know of. Uh, and then now they come along and say, we want to go on the other side of the road and, and use that same contract zone. And I'm thinking, geez, I'd give them what they want in their contract zone, but leave our area alone. Two acres, two acre lots. That's all we're asking for. We want our privacy. Um, it's all about a waiting list, and uh, I don't really care about their waiting list. I just want to protect our, our neighborhood. And uh, if Piper Shores wants to go up there and put two acre lots everywhere and build sim single family homes, that's awesome. That's just what we have. And we'd, 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 we'd expect that to happen in this particular piece of property, not this huge density they're talking about. Um, that's just the way I feel. I don't have a lot of technical things to say, but uh, that's <laughs> the way it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you could just, for folks that are interested, maybe just kind of. Uh, my name is Bob Yencha. Um, I live on Stone Ridge Drive. Um, one of my neighbors is here. <clears throat> Another of our neighbors is not able to make it tonight. Uh, there's three of us at the top of the hill there. <clears throat> we have water quality concerns. Since we're all on wells, there's no way to bring city water up there. And with the amount of land disturbance and blasting that's proposed, uh, that's an issue. But I just also want to say, my wife and I just built that home four years ago. We're the new kids on the block. And a driving factor was the zoning. We lived on Westbrook Street, an extremely busy street in Portland for 25 years, and really researched, uh, spent seven years looking for land before we found this property on Stone Ridge Drive and built our house four years ago. So we're very concerned about this sudden flip um, of the zoning, uh, again, for all the reasons that the people spoke, so I won't belabor the point, but just want to bring that to your attention. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is uh, Jeff Jones. I live at 14 Acorn Lane, and we're direct debaters to this project. And um, the residents of Acorn Lane submitted a letter to the planning board and all the residents on Acorn Lane have opposed this project. And that letter has been signed by all the residents of Acorn Lane. So, and I want to make sure that everyone is clear that um, as far as I know, all of the abutters to this project on both sides all oppose it. There's no one in favor of this project as it exists today. For, to start with, I'm not sure that this is applicable to be a Fifth Amendment. That I think that's a bad precedent for the town to take that this is 
this is across the road. This isn't to contiguous property. This is a different project. And what happens, it sets a point where when we talk about, well, there's no open space in these 45 acres. You're, you're, you're leaving no open space. Well, we, we, we gave you 90 acres across the street, so that, we're counting that. But when we, when we talk about traffic, oh, they're saying, well, don't look at the traffic from the first five or four amendments. This is just a little modest amount of traffic. So I don't think they can have it both ways. And I think that's why it's a bad precedent from the town to include this as just an amendment to what's happened across the street. This is a whole different project, and it's, and it's not related to that. It's got its own different issues. And for them to not have for any open space on the 45 acres, claiming that it's part of the original project, but, but we can't count the traffic that's happened from the original traffic, which started with substantial, and then it has been four modest increases. And when you start with substantial increase 20 years ago and add four modest increases, then you have dangerous. And that's what Spurwink Road is right now. We don't believe there's any public benefit it's not compatible with the existing neighborhood. There's no dedicated open space. There's not adding many jobs for this project at all. It's not even touted by the applicant as, that, as doing that. Not adding diversity in Scarborough. All it's doing is creating additional traffic and pedestrian issues to a, a road that's already significantly dangerous over the last 20 years. The town has expanded Higgins Beach parking and it's great, there's a lot more people coming down there now, year round, and there's been four amendments to Piper Shores, and that has kept getting more and more people. And it's at the breaking point, but there's been no increase or any change in the infrastructure. And we need sidewalks, and the applicant has refused to do that. The applicant, <coughs> the applicant stated that they've had plenty of meetings with us, and, and I don't disagree, I've been involved with many of them. But, and they listened to us, but they make no changes. We've asked for sidewalks along 77, they don't want to propose any. We've asked for dedicated open space to the property that basically used to be Rabbitat Habitat, um, that was open space where the trails are, they've not agreed to do any of that. We've asked for the commons to be lower, to be smaller, and the units are the same as they were in the initial submission. That you know, and they took obje objection to me calling it a Holiday Inn Express behind my house. And so I'll put it to more, to give you an idea of the structure, it's going to be seven times bigger than the Higgins Beach Inn, and it's going to be two times bigger than the Comfort Inn on Route 1. That's the size of the common, and they're putting it in the highest piece of land of the whole 45 acres. So they're taking the highest point on the entire project and then building it up from there. And, they, and of course, they're going to going to be higher than what's allowed by zoning. You know, the height is, is long, is bigger than 35 feet, right? They want four stories. So, um, so I see my time is up, but I just wanted to, I, um, I just want to let you know that we have some serious objections that the planning board and we have asked them that if you're going to have nine additional units, you should put them on the plan. And even today with their recent submission, they still refuse to do that. They, they're, they will not show us where those other nine units. They want 61 units from the town council, but we're not going to. But they refuse to show us where the other nine are going to go. So we want that that all that area to be open space, dedicated, and either to the town, to the Scarborough Land Trust, <coughs> conservation easement, so that there can't be any further development. And then this is a, just another camel's nose under the tent by Piper Shores, and get ready for Amendment Number Six. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Beginski, and I'm neighbors with Bob on Stone Ridge. Uh, we moved there about six years ago from a different part of Scarborough for the, for the privacy the, and, and the proximity to Camp Ketcha and trails. Uh, just two comments in addition to the, uh, to the excellent points raised about the zoning points. Um, I have concerns about the traffic. Uh, I no longer ride my bike in that part of Spurwink from safety concerns from car volume, and I do have concerns about a large number of new units and drivers um, independent of the zoning issue and how many lots go in there. And I also have concerns about the water quality. That entire area, to my understanding, is a ridge, and those of us on wells have marginal wells right now to begin with. Um, just concerned about the effects of blasting necessary for a project of this, si um, of this size and how this will affect 
our water quality and the functions of our wells. Thank you. Would anybody else like? Again, if people do want to speak, it'd be it'd be just it'd be helpful if they just kind of line up and thank you. Yeah, good evening. Thank you so much for having this workshop tonight with the planning board and the town council. This is wonderful that you can bring us all together to learn about this. I think this has been a process. On both sides, I would say I'm a resident. My name is Lucia DeMarco Jones. I live on 14 Acorn Lane. Um, we have been attending the meetings um, with Piper Shores. We've been very interested in what's been happening, but to be quite honest, there haven't been a whole lot of changes since the beginning. They have heard our concerns about the scale, the size, uh, the contract zone changes, everything that people have said, we have heard no changes. Many of the things that we have raised, they've um, basically deflected and said it's not their concern to fix anything with the traffic. Um, they feel like they've done their traffic study and it is what it is. Um, as a resident there of 20 years on Acorn Lane, it's gone, uh, it's been become, um, you know, we moved there for the proximity to the beaches and the privacy and the beauty of the area. And I feel that this size and scale of project um, would significantly change the character. From my personal perspective, my backyard, we would be looking at the uh, four-story building. Um, I know since our last meeting that we had, there was a balloon test that occurred on December 26th, the day after Christmas. Unfortunately, many of us were out of town. We could not see what that balloon test was. Um, but from what I say, or from what I know about the project, that main building would be sitting on a ridge. I can see the McDonald's house right now from my backyard. And I'm imagining that something of, of you know three, four times, seven times larger, it will most definitely be visible from my. So it's definitely going to impact what we're seeing, and the fact that they did not um, list the additional houses um, right now. You know, the 61 is the maximum limit that they're looking for. They still have not listed where are those houses going or where are those permits going to be. So it just feels like it's not fully, fully transparent. And I know that this is a a work in progress, and I'm really hoping that the, this workshop, the planning board, and the town council will assist in, in really hearing the residents' perspective. Um, we're really trying very hard to stay informed about what's happening and what are the possibilities and the changes that can happen. But even with the letter that came, there's a meeting tomorrow night that they are holding. Um, welcome the letter. I love the fact that they're being inviting us to these uh, as a butters to these meetings. But we did not know about this meeting tonight. So again, it just feels like. We're really trying to stay on top of this as a resident, but as you know, as a working parent and so forth, to try to keep on top of what's happening with government, it is difficult. I'm not familiar with all of the technicalities, uh, like many people have so eloquently said, but I just know it's going to change my backyard significantly, and I really hope that people take all of this into consideration. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? So seeing none, I guess I we close public comment. And at this point in time, well, we've asked for a presentation. I, it's up to you whether you'd like to retire down to the tables here or, or sit here and receive the presentation. Uh, let's let's stay here. Maybe easier if you have questions. Uh, yeah, sure. I think uh, Jim Adamovich would pick it up. Uh, Mr. Chair, when did yes. you want to need to help people about? Oh, yes, excuse, excuse me, thank you. Um, <laughs> can I interrupt just for a second? Sure. Jean Marie would like to, Councillor Caterina would like to share something with us and the public. So. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done this before when this first started. I just wanted to make sure everyone understands that my cousin James A. Bennett is the treasurer of the board at Piper Shores. He and I have an agreement. We don't discuss Piper Shores ever, and I have absolutely no financial interest or connection um, with Piper Shores, but I just wanted that to be open to the public, so you'll know that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, good evening. I'm Jim Adamovich. I'm CEO of Maine Life Care Retirement Community Incorporated. We do business as Piper Shores. Um, we're pleased to provide um, this presentation to a joint meeting of town council and the planning board uh, this evening as part of this workshop. Um, our organization has had the privilege of presenting before town authorities a number of times during 2018. As well, we've had an opportunity on numerous occasions to present with uh, the abutters of the Dorado project. 
Um, we first met with town council on the first reading of the contract zone amendment on June 20th of 18. Um, subsequent to that, we had an informal review with the planning board of the town on July 16th. Uh, we also had a preliminary plan and review with the planning board on November 19th, which unfortunately was a bit curtailed because of the hour of the evening. And most recently, we did submit um, revised plans and a detailed response to the planning board on December 21st in preparation for the upcoming January 14th planning board meeting. So we've had a number of outreaches over the course of the last six or so months with regard to this initiative. Um, our, this, our presentation this evening is really focused on uh, an overall review of our plans to expand the Piper Shores community by constructing 52 independent living housing accommodations along with limited support services at the current address of 5 Dorado Drive. In addition, we'd like to discuss um, three key aspects of uh, this initiative, uh, specifically the contract zone amendment secondary to the comprehensive plan. Uh, the public benefit to be provided by this project, as well as some detailed response to concerns that have been previously expressed by the abutters to the Dorado property, as well as some of the uh, comments that were offered this evening. Uh, with me this evening are several representatives of organizations that are assisting Piper Shores on this effort. Uh, Sebago Technics is performing our civil engineering services um, Vice President Will Conroy, uh, Conway, I'm sorry, is with us this evening. Uh, our architectural firm, RLPS Architects, which is a nationally recognized leader in senior housing and design, is represented by uh, partner Greg Scott and his associate Dustin Julius. Charlie Katz Levy, legal counsel from Jensen Baird, is here, and um, Charlie will talk with you this evening in some length with regard to the, the comprehensive plan, and also Eric Dalen, who is a principal with One Point Partners, who is assisting us with owner's representation services. Um, Piper Shores continues to value its ongoing relationship with the town of Scarborough. We have been, we believe, an excellent corporate citizen since 2001. I think we have demonstrated considerable value to the town of Scarborough in numerous ways, but first and foremost in providing outstanding senior housing and health care services to almost 350 current residents at Piper Shores, as well as providing jobs and um, support for nearly 240 staff members. Our project, we believe, represents an ongoing commitment to the town of Scarborough, to the residents of Scarborough and beyond to provide excellence in senior housing services. We are among one of the few organizations nationally that provides this excellent program and service, which really makes us unique. We're unique in the state of Maine as the only life care retirement community serving the entire state of Maine. We're very proud of that distinction. Um, with that, I'd like to now introduce uh, Will Conway from Sebago Technics to speak to some of the changes that have occurred in the plan over the course of the, the most recent six months. Will? Uh, thank you, Jim. Members of the Council and Planning Board, um, I'll try to be brief. The uh, slide, and I'm going to refer to this screen because the pointer doesn't work on the other ones. So this is the property, and um, what this plan really represents is a very innovative project. There's nothing like this in Scarborough. There's nothing like this in Maine. Um, and I say innovative, um, and the project architect will describe it uh, better than I can. But this is uh, the first area, the pocket neighborhood. There's um, eight buildings. There are duplexes. There are 16 units. And it's arranged with all of the circulation on the perimeter. And all of the buildings sort of open up onto these two green spaces. 
of which then in turn open up into this central meadow area. One of the benefits of the project to the town, but you may not realize that this is developed as R2, is it protects the uh, uh, corridor along Spurwink Road. There's a ridge line about where my, my green line is, so if you're traveling on this corridor, you can't see any of this development. Uh, the second area is the estate neighborhood, which is again a pocket neighborhood design. Um, and then the third element is the hybrid commons building here, which uh, we've heard comments about the scale and bulk of that building, and our project architect will address that um, in, as part of our presentation. But I would point out, and it's not unlike a nursing home, which is a permitted use in the RF zone. Uh, this is the frontage of the site, and it shows as the planning board members that are here tonight will recall that they requested that we make a pedestrian connection from the Dorado project to the existing Piper Shores, which would make it possible for a public resident, any public resident, to walk or cross-country ski from Higgins Beach through the Piper Shores campus, through the Dorado property, onto the Camp Ketcha property, and to the Libby River Preserve. So that is a, a major uh, public benefit that we'll cite as well. Uh, one of the things that, um, that we've done on the project is um, we provided for a 75-foot buffer along the Newcomb Ridge Road. There's currently no vegetation in that area. So we're uh, planning to construct an earthen berm eight to ten feet in height, and then planting a double row of uh, significantly uh, grown evergreen trees to screen this neighborhood from Newcomb Ridge. This is a cross-section of that uh, area, this being Newcomb Ridge here, this being the, uh, the berm, and again the required setback here is 50 feet to a building, so you could have no berm no buffering in a building in this position, or you can do what we're proposing here. The building setback, which is uh, 50 feet, is over 100 feet in this diagram. This is the central meadow area here. Uh, the blue uh, area is a stormwater pond. It'll have a permanent uh, pool elevation. So it, it serves two functions. It, um, manages the stormwater, as well as serves as an amenity uh, central to the project. Another change that we made to the plan uh, at the request of the planning board was we added a walkway connection crossing the meadow to link this neighborhood with the estate neighborhood down in this area here. This is the commons building here. Um, you approach on the access drive you come in and drive under the building. It's a three-story building on the front side, a four-story building on the um, lower side. And uh, again, it's, it, it's broken up into three sort of segments, which the architects will describe that in better detail than I can. This is the estates neighborhood here. There's eight single-family uh, homes, again, they're oriented in, with uh, circulation on the perimeter and fronting the units onto these two green pocket areas. This is the uh, public trailhead, and as you can see from this slide, our original proposal included a maintenance building in that area, which has been removed from the plan. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Scott and Dustin Julius from RLPA. Thank you, and thank you for this opportunity to meet with you this evening. I know where you're coming from. I've worn your shoes. As a member and president of Lancaster City Council, I know exactly where you are. I know exactly where you are, and I certainly appreciate the power and input of public comment. That was a great seven-year experience I had. This evening, it, it appears that most of the focus is on the land use as it is the land planning. That being said, we'll take a few minutes to talk about the land planning. So with regard to overview, and Will did a great job, but kind of globally, 
we've taken the, the acreage and we've used sensitivity in terms of where we position buildings. So along the edges, we have the one-story structures, and in the core, the center of the site, we have the, the taller structure. And that was done intentionally. We've also used, as Will didn't say, was neo-traditional planning, which is tighter density, more compact. By doing that, it allows much more green space, open space. It's a tradition that started in our country in the 1920s and is now being brought back. I'm going to turn the focus, would you have two minutes, Dustin? Over yeah. to Dustin yeah. Julius, <laughs> my associate, because if he runs too long, it's his fault, not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Greg. Again, Dustin Julius, I'm a designer with our LPS Architects, and thank you, Will, for kind of overviewing each of these components. And Greg already mentioned, but really there's a, a sensitivity from the master planning uh, perspective to look at this community as these clusters of housing opportunities. So we looked at this piece um, as it's been called the pocket neighborhood component because it really focuses on this notion that the center green is the highlighted element here. So there's a real effort to push the landscape in, in, in these pocket neighborhoods. So not necessarily um, from just the, the organization of the houses themselves, but how it then relates to um, to the size and scale of each individual structure. So these again are just our one story duplex uh, neighborhoods that are clustered more tightly together. We took this a very similar approach to the estate homes. Again, this, this is a, a mix of one and two story structures um, and really centering their front doors around these open green spaces. And as Will mentioned, um, in both really connecting back to that large meadow space um, that would be the, uh, the conjoining factor. Um, you can see here the size and scale as it's represented against uh, the size of, of a lot of the trees that are in that, that space. But I want to focus our attention tonight on this hybrid component and some of the discussions that Piper Shores has been having uh, alongside with our LPS um, about the size and scale. Um, as was mentioned at our previous discussions, um, there's a lot of concern about this building. Will has already highlighted that from its earliest conception, this, build, this building was broken down into three components. You can see here from a, uh, a site plan that it really is two wings that build the, the two apartments, or clusters of apartments, and then that center space is where the commons uh, preside. You can see that in plan here as well. That yellow space is all about the commons amenities, amenities that are being provided um, as part of this development. Um, and then this just shows the extension of some of those that spill out onto the meadow itself. Um, but we were previously showing uh, this perspective, which shows uh, the building height as it's defined uh, at 55 feet. And since then, with a lot of conversation, significant deliberation on the side of Piper Shores, along with our LPS architects and all of our consultants, we've been studying what would happen if we could bring the building height significantly down, um, in this case, all the way to 40 feet. Um, and that's what we are currently looking at in this perspective, um, in eliminating a lot of the pitched roofs on the upper stories, especially over those resident wings, we're able to significantly reduce the overall height as it's defined of this structure. So again, from the perspective, the long view, this is actually from the highest point, that sort of berm that um, Will was mentioning, where you know, we are now onto the property, we're not from Spurwing, um, but you can see the size and scale as it relates to the pocket neighborhood to the left. This building really is of a very similar size and scale from that perspective. Um, again, that was just the toggle between the pitched and the flat. Um, but just, again, looking at, at it from this perspective, in an effort to, to look very tough at how we can get this building back into a size and scale um, while still maintaining the character and feel of this community, um, we really feel that this is a, an opportunity um, for Piper Shores to, to come together um, in an effort for this project to move forward. I'll hand it back to Will to talk in discussion of the balloon launch. Thank you. Uh, so we were requested uh, by at the end of the 11-19 uh, planning board m meeting to do this test. And so what we did was we, uh, we threw three, three balloons. We were planning to do four, but we ran out of helium. <laughs> so. Um, and they were flown at the lower height that Dustin had um, mentioned. So those balloons were set at the 40-foot roof height. And then we took 11 uh, high-resolution photographs starting on Newcomb Road, along Spurwink Road, and then along Acorn Lane. 
and we found uh, the balloons visible from two locations. This is at the, um, I'll toggle that. So the two locations were right here on Newcomb. Look, you could see that balloon. And then from the furthest point out on uh, Newcomb, we could see this balloon. Um, from the, these two positions here in Newcomb, the land kind of dips down and the topography naturally screens it. And then um, along uh, Spurling Road, the ridge line that I mentioned precluded any views. And then along Acorn Lane, um, we tried to see and photograph between the, the residences, and we couldn't see the balloons. Now, I will say that um, we didn't go onto people's yards. We, could, we couldn't take the view from the rear yards of these uh, homes, but from the public street, uh, there was uh, nothing visible in that area. Um, I'd like to just take a few can, minutes to... Can you to go back to that previous slide? Sure. That one? No, the one before that. The, the, yes. Could you have taken pictures from here on your property? So that you would have been getting the backyard view of Acorn? Uh, yeah, we could have. That would have given people a better idea of what Acorn's going to experience. Well, I would say yes and no. I agree with you in principle, but the other thing is there's uh, considerable existing vegetation on the abutting properties that also offers some softening. Mm -hmm. um, We've, we've heard this word transparency, and it really bothers us. And um, I'll, I'll speak to that in just a minute, because uh, we really have made an effort to reach out to our abutters. In terms of the contract zoning agreement, um, our attorney will uh, address that. And you heard from a couple of people tonight about traffic impacts. Well, here are the numbers. So we're, this project will generate 130 trips. The current volume of trips on Spurwink Road right now is 3,560. So we are increasing the traffic by 3.7%. We think that's a very minor uh, impact. Also, you heard that there's a, a safety concern today that exists without this project even going forward. And while we're good citizens, we don't feel like it's our responsibility, which is why we have not offered to build sidewalks um, along Spurling. You heard uh, concerns about blasting, which are legitimate concerns. Uh, what people may not know, or they, they would if they read our uh, December 21st uh, submission letter to the town, is the project is also being reviewed by the main DEP. And that requires us to prepare a blasting plan, which conforms to not only uh, DEP standards, but the US Bureau of Mines. And there's a couple things about it to, for you folks that are concerned. Um, one is it requires us to do a pre-blast survey of all existing structures, including wells, uh, within 500 feet of the property. And then to control the power of the blast, and the duration of them, uh, and also to monitor it uh, during uh, blasting operations. So the DEP um, has that in place for a reason, to address these kind of concerns, and we will comply with the uh, provisions. We heard at the 19th meeting that our wetland delineation was inaccurate, uh, that there are wetlands in the meadow that we didn't map, and uh, that is simply not the case. Our wetland scientist follows the U.S. Army Corps uh, method for delineating <coughs> wetlands, and the town peer review uh, consultant concurred with our delineation. Uh, we heard a comment that the stormwater ponds are uh, oversized. That's a true statement. Uh, it's an accurate statement. The reason for it is um, 
although we have no idea where we might put additional nine units. It could go in the front, could go in the back, but in the, in the event that they are built, that we wouldn't want to be disturbing those um, features. In terms of site lighting, uh, we don't have it tonight, but we did show a diagram to the planning board on the 19th. Um, we're proposing full cutoff fixtures. Uh, they're only 20 feet in height, and the light spillover will not even get near any of our abutting property lines. And in addition to that, something that, that we um, committed to in our recent submission uh, to the planning board is that we will dim these light fixtures at 11 p.m. to further mitigate that concern. And you've heard from um, our architect team on the building height and mass, so that would be a conclusion. This slide shows the uh, chronology of the meetings that we've had with the abutters. We've had 12 interfaces, or excuse me, not that many, but nine. Well, eight, actually, because one of them's tomorrow night. Um, and we'll have more. We'll have as many as they want. Uh, Jim uh, is very open. Whenever asked by an individual abutter, he's agreed to meet with them, often in their kitchens. And that will continue throughout this process. And with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, legal counsel, Charlie Katzlevy. Thank you, Will. And, uh, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to present. Um, you know, no one typically enjoys hearing from the attorney, so <laughs> I'll try and keep it uh, as brief as I can. Uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the contract zone process and the comprehensive plan and some of the comments that have come up. Um, the voters have raised a number of issues, among them that the contract zone amendment is inconsistent with the town's comprehensive plan. And um, in addition, that um, the permitted uses are not consistent with the existing zone. <clears throat> this argument is often raised in response to contract zones. It's a kind of catch-all that's thrown in every time a contract zone is pr proposed. <coughs> it has never prevailed in court, not one time. That's because contract zoning is a legislative act, so great respect and deference is given to the municipal legislative body's decision. <coughs> to be consistent with a comprehensive plan, an amendment only needs to be in basic harmony with the comprehensive plan, which is an extremely low bar. However, um, in this case, it far exceeds basic <laughs> harmony. This particular uh, project, we feel, is entirely consistent with the comprehensive plan. It promotes uh, diversification of affordable housing options. It promotes uh, senior housing. It, um, it does a number of things. If I can read to you uh, from the comprehensive plan, this is in the limited growth sector, and the limited growth sector in the definition has clustered developments with standards for significant open space protection, interconnected street network, and a mix of housing types, single family duplexes, and townhouses are encouraged. Um, as for permitted uses, nursing homes are permitted uses. There's also been a little bit of confusion regarding um, the amendments to the existing contract zone. I've heard Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment. This is the second amendment to the contract zone. Contract zone has only been amended uh, one previous time. Mm -hmm. Check the registry of deeds. It's, that's what you'll find is the original contract zone, one amendment. Um, it's entirely consistent that this would be an amendment, given that it's the same applicant. It's across the street. It's an integrated campus. Um, but I should also add that it's uh, sort of form over substance because it's the same review, review criteria, whether it would be a new zone or an amendment. So um, there is dedicated open space. I've heard a comment about that. Um, in addition to the uh, non-buildable buffers, um, we're proposing a declaration of covenants to protect a uh, public trail network 
in perpetuity. Um, I think the key thing I want to point out is this issue has already been litigated. And it's been litigated specifically with this contract zone. The main Supreme Judicial Court heard this same argument 20 years ago in Crispin v. Town of Scarborough when the abutters challenged the original contract zone. And the main Supreme Judicial Court was clear and unequivocal in upholding the contract zone that the town council approved 20 years ago. So uh, in sum, um, we believe that um, the council has the authority. Uh, we believe that that issue has been settled. And uh, we believe that um, this project is consistent with the plan. Thank you. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you just to stay for a second? I think sure. some may have some questions. I certainly have some questions. Can you help clarify? I've heard it three or four times tonight, and it's actually in your memo on page two. And you refer, you've referred to it as a nursing home several times. Mm -hmm. and can you describe for me how you're defining a nursing home? I mean, I see sing individual residences with dining facilities. Yeah. How is that a nursing home? How, how, how are you defining that? Sure. Well, you know, we have to come up with some kind of classification, and we could say um, that the independent living is more like single-family residential, which I think we'd agree is a permitted use within the zone. I'm going with a higher classification, which is also permitted in this particular zone, um, because of the fact that in the overall project scheme, uh, you can graduate to a nursing home facility, um, including memory care and, and so forth. So we went with the more um, intensive use. Um, but I do agree that this um, uh, particular use on this site is more uh, consistent with uh, residential. Does, does anybody else have any questions from a legal perspective? Yeah. I the, um, the court case you referenced, that's, that's essentially upholding a council's decision. They're not necessarily ruling on the validity of whether the contract zone was good or bad. They are just siding on the side of the council's decision, correct, being a legislative body? Uh, among various other things, uh, they upheld that the uh, contract zone was um, consistent with the comprehensive plan. That, that, that they upheld the town council's, that was challenged by the... Uh, the council's uh, decision. Was. <laughs> correct. So that's, to be clear, that's really what that, the, the case that you're citing, that's what that was about. Uh, uh, among various other objections related to due process okay. and, and so forth. Yeah. Okay. I had a question. Um, I know we're way down the road in terms of this uh, being an amendment process as opposed to an application process. Mm -hmm. Can you help to explain? Uh, you mentioned that the criteria are the same for either process, but how was that decision made to pursue this as an amendment versus uh, being required to pursue this as a, an application? Uh, that that uh, decision was made by my predecessor, uh, a lawyer named Ron Epstein, um, and frankly, I think he thought it was the logical decision. I've consulted with several attorneys in our municipal department, and there's an existing contract zone in place. It's directly across the street. It's uh, the same integrated campus. It's the same applicant. Um, I don't think we put a whole lot of thought in it because it just made sense. For so what it's worth, the applicant did approach uh, town staff uh, in the formative stages of this. We did uh, have a conversation with the town attorney who agreed that that would be the preferable uh, uh, approach. And you mentioned that there was a, this was, would be the second amendment to the first contract zone. What was the first amendment? Um, I have a copy of it, and I, and I would like to point out that the first amendment has a maximum height of 39 feet, and we're asking for a maximum height of 40 feet which is a change in 12 inches. Um, uh, it, it dealt with height. It dealt with uh, density. Um, it's a very simple uh, amendment, uh, two pages, um, but uh, increasing the density and, and increasing the height. And I, I just want to tie back to one other comment. You know, there's been a lot of uh, focus on the 61 versus 52 units. So what, um, why uh, is the, the, the Piper Shores uh, 
uh, been so persistent in sticking with that higher number, you know, our my understanding is that in the past there have been sort of trade-offs, you know, where those approvals, you know, uh, were used for other purposes. So can you can you get into a little detail and help us understand, maybe shed some light on what the intent would be and what the longer-term plan might be about the, <coughs> that, that discrepancy between those two numbers of units? I'll give it a shot. Um, right now we're looking for 52 units, and that's what the um, – site plan and, and planning board process will be seeking um, and when they do the, when they apply the subdivision criteria and so forth it will be for 52 <coughs> units um, in order to um, avoid having to redo this entire process again in a few years um, we'd like to preserve the ability to do 60 but there's no current plan um, based on economics based on a number of factors to do 60 units or 61 units um, and because there's no plan to do it, and because it's not been modeled, it's not been cited, it's not really been considered, uh, we don't even know where those nine units would go. It's, it's uh, entirely hypothetical, and if we did do the uh, additional units, we'd be back before the planning board uh, for site plan and subdivision review, and they would have an opportunity at that time, if the applicant wanted to seek those additional units, to consider where they were cited in the infrastructure and everything else, traffic, et cetera. The uh, contract zone standard versus the contract zone amendment standard, uh, trying to get a clarification on whether there's any difference in the standard of review by the town council mm -hmm. for it being a contract zone amendment versus an original contract zone. I'm not aware of any substantive difference, but I would suggest that the uh, town, you know, if that's, a, if that's an important question to the council, that you consult with the town's attorney. Um, you know, from, from my perspective, um, it was, it's logical, given that there is an existing contract zone, um, that we are amending the existing contract zone. Um, but if, um, if you want, want to ask your attorney, uh, you know, that, that's reasonable. I'm, I, my expertise is in real estate law and represent a lot of real estate developers. I'm not a municipal attorney. I don't represent towns. Good. I can't speak to the difference in standard review, but there's a process difference, uh, whereas a, uh, a new application would, would begin with a joint meeting of the planning board and town council. Uh, in the amendment approach, it bypasses that first step uh, or does not require that joint meeting as a start. In part, uh, I think this session tonight is uh, is intended to help kind of shore that up and, and maybe fill in some of those gaps in the process. When you say the uh, it promotes diversification of affordable housing, is that strictly due to the agreement to contribute to the affordable housing initiative of the town? I think I read in the agreement of somewhere around one hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars, or is that are you saying that the development itself is going to have affordable housing in it? No, you know, the, when I talk about the benefits of the physical construction, it's more in the diversification of um, the type of housing stock with the, with the innovative cluster development and um, the apartment-style housing and, and so forth. Um, when I talk about um, the benefit to, to low-income housing, I'm talking about the uh, $122,000 uh, contribution to the housing yeah. fund. Okay. And is it an apartment complex? The apartment housing, is that the nursing home you're referring to? When you uh, No, that would be independent living. That's the 40-foot um, hybrid building. Um, the, the apartment it, building. Correct. It okay. would have independent living, and then it would have a dining hall and some other amenities. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to be clear, but that, the nursing component is across the street at the original complex. Is, Co correct. Is, is that uh, how you're characterizing th it? This contract zone amendment requires... Um, that all of the, the dwelling units be uh, part of the independent living. And, and I think that's enough said. Just a, just a quick question to kind of build on Council Johnson. In, in part of our comprehensive goal is to try to make more affordable housing available for residents of Scarborough. Do you know what the, the demographics of the residents of Piper Shores is yeah. today? How many Scarborough residents, how many Maine residents, and how many from out of state? That would be a question for Jim. Before anybody else have any other yeah. um, memory? For Jim would be, I, one of my questions is what percent of Scarborough folks have moved to Piper Shores? 
And my second question is, how many main care patients do you currently serve in the whole work Not a few. Should we go down there? I'm going to give you some approximations because yeah. I do not have those statistics at hand, but we'll certainly get them and uh, share them back with town council. Um, by and large, Piper Shores has historically attracted residents from Maine as their principal former residents. I would say over the past few years, we are seeing more and more residents that are either spending their summers here and then domiciling elsewhere or splitting their time between Maine and perhaps another location. Um, on average, we are probably around 70% of our residents that um, come to us with a prior main address. And again, that will fluctuate. Uh, as I've indicated, the trend in the last few years is more people coming from away. Um, with regard to the question about main care, we do not participate as a community in main care. And the reason why is we are self-insured for the health care needs of our residents. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take an entrance fee on behalf of an applicant, which when they pass on is 90% is refundable to their estate. They also pay a monthly maintenance fee to continue to reside in the community. Those fees then support the health care needs of all of the residents in Piper Shores. So if, if you have any familiarity with the insurance industry, we're what's known as a self-insured risk pool. And so as a result, we do, not, we do not participate in any federal or state program for residents who are medically indigent. We take care of our residents through uh, the resources of Piper Shores. And where I'm going with this is I know that you have applied for a <coughs> tax exemption for the whole work unit uh, for whatever the legal reasons are, and that's a concern to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and, and f is figuring into my thinking on this whole picture here because it's like, all right, so yeah, you've been a great corporate citizen. Um, you, you've definitely given us some tax value, you know, over, over uh, the years. Yes. You're our, you're, I believe you're our highest taxpayer. By more than two to one. Um, but I'm a taxpayer too. Sure. So is a lot of other people, you know, sitting here in the audience. Sure. Um, and, and we talk about benefit. My big thing with this whole thing is what the heck is the benefit to the town? And it's disturbing to me mm -hmm. to hear, you know, oh, no, we don't participate in main care. Um, we don't know the percentage of people from Scarborough. Because when I look right. at our comprehensive plan and I look at affordable housing and whatever, I do a lot of work with seniors myself from, in a real estate point of view. Yes. And we have a dearth of housing options available to seniors and a dearth of beds available for main care. Um, so I, that's where I'm coming yeah. from with this, and I'm not apt to want to say yes, yes. to what you're proposing mm -hmm. because I don't see the benefit to the town. So that's where I'm Sure, from. sure. And let me just take a moment to talk about main care. In effect, what we are doing is we are, we are providing a public community benefit by relieving the taxpayers of the state of Maine from having to fund the long-term care needs for residents who may have depleted their assets. So any resident that moves into Piper Shores, should they deplete their assets, continues to reside at Piper Shores, receives the same level of care as any other resident who might be paying their full fees. The, the other thing that I would point out with regard to housing and the question about affordable housing uh, by statute, with the Bureau of Insurance, we're required every three years to do an actuarial study. It's a 20-year assessment of residents and the expenses and income associated with their care. Um, in the most recent study, about a third of our apartments, now we have 160 apartments and 40 cottages, about a third of our apartments on an actuarial basis we're either in a deficit or at a modest break-even. So 
we are in effect providing um, a benefit, an affordable housing benefit. Now you might say, well, it's relative. Right. That's true, but the fact is that we are providing services at a cost in excess of the revenue that are, we are collecting from about a third of the residents. So I, I, I would respectfully contend that we are doing our part even though we don't participate in main care, we're actually doing a little bit more because we are making sure that there is no responsibility of the, the taxpayers to provide that care and service for those residents who have depleted. So, and since you brought it up, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, it's okay. Um, what, was, what would be the lowest cost to enter Piper Shores? Because I know you have a formula. There's an entrance fee, right. as I said. It's, it depends upon the size of the accommodation and whether it's single occupancy or double occupancy. Right. Um, so the lowest amount is about $200,000 in terms of an entrance fee. Now, let me provide you some context with that because that, it's a lot of money. But let me explain because I think it's important that you know the benefits that are provided. Residents who move into apartments are provided with at least one meal per day. They're provided with weekly housekeeping services. They are provided with full maintenance and utilities with the exception of long distance telephone and internet access. They are provided with transportation four days a week for medical appointments for other activities. They are provided with access to fitness center, to a swimming pool. They are provided with all kinds of other social opportunities. Most importantly, they are provided with an unlimited health care benefit in either a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. So, for example, if as a 75-year-old, if you went out and tried to buy a policy for unlimited health care, even if you could find it, mm -hmm. you'd probably be paying somewhere close to fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year if you could get it. Absolutely. So, we are embedding in that fee structure a service-rich package. And then we are refunding 90% of that upfront payment to the estate of the resident. And, and don't you require an income? A certain People have to have a certain income to, because uh, I've, I've sure, done there, tours of your facility and sure. I've looked at, would I ever want to live in Piper Shores? Yes. And I know um, on your website it talks about, you know, in order to get in here, you should have two times whatever the asset number is based on you know the type of unit you want to move into, and then you should have two times whatever the in uh, for income of yes. whatever your yeah. month because you pay a monthly yeah. fee. Once yes, you go in that's too. correct. That's a rough so that's a rough estimate of of what. So what's the lowest? Well, I mentioned the entrance fee, and then you would do the multiplier on top of that. Right. It, it really, it also depends upon your revenue stream, and I don't want to get into uh, financially underwriting, but someone may have a very strong monthly income that qualifies them in a different way if they had, right. for example, a lot of investments. But where I'm going with this is uh, Piper Shore is, is not an affordable place. I mean, it's not a, a lot of people think, oh, I can never afford going there. And that's not true either. But it does, in my opinion, um, you've got to be middle, middle class or upper middle class with mm. assets and whatever to yes. go in there. So what I'm looking for as a counselor under the yes. benefit point of view is what sort of a benefit can you offer to the citizens of Skyro, the hard working uh, Mrs. Sure. Mulligan, who lives down the street from me, who has an income of twelve, fourteen thousand dollars a year sure. in Social Security, she pays taxes to the town of Scarborough, but yet, what's the benefit to her for me yeah. for up yeah. side down the, on the uh, apple cart with uh, sure. changing an RF zone the, into the, something more dense? The reality is that that securing retirement living services is not unlike finding homes in general. If you have, a, if you have an annual income of $14,000, you're probably not going to live along the beach. The reality is, is that you are, you know, housing and healthcare services are in fact based upon um, 
the, the relative ability of one to pay for those services. Um, I'd like to no, live no. on the beach, but I can't. No, no, no. And that's so not, that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, what are you? What would you be willing to provide in lieu of? Because I agree, Mrs. Sh McGillicuddy can't afford to go to sure. private I'm not asking for that necessarily. Sure. But I'm just not feeling the benefit here. Yeah. Well, let me take a moment to share what we think are some of the community benefits, because we think they're, we think they're significant. In, in large part, we think we've provided, for 18 years, a number of community benefits to Scarborough. Um, certainly availability of housing, whether, you, whether one believes it's at a, a relatively affordable level or not. The fact is that we do have residents from Scarborough that move to Piper Shores. Mm -hmm. We have residents from Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. from, from away. So we are serving a bona fide housing need, a specialized housing need. Beyond the housing piece, though, we are serving and providing a service package that, what, that is in well in excess of the value of the housing. Mm -hmm. For anybody who's had to pay, for a month in a skilled nursing facility, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure you appreciate what, I, what I'm saying by that. Mm -hmm. The average monthly fee in a skilled nursing facility is between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars a year. The average monthly fee at Piper Shores is somewhere around thirty-four hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So you can see the value that the residents that use those services mm -hmm. are accruing by virtue of their residency at Piper Shores. And then I'll, I'll end until we get to the start. I'm sorry, I get all fired up. <laughs> 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 one point. You raised one issue. I think yeah. I can address it. Um, you, you, you did raise uh, an issue of, of taxes, and I just wanted to make the point, because it, since you did raise it, yep. this contract zone amendment expressly provides that all 61 units will yes, be fully I'm taxable. Aware of that. Okay. I just, I'm just concerned about the other piece, but that's okay. I know we've kind of interrupted your presentation. Yes. Councillor Donovan has been trying to get a word in edgewise, so I'll let him. <laughs> Always <laughs> happy to take Councillor Donovan's uh, questions. Yeah, Thank you. Over. <laughs> really picking up on uh, Councillor Katarina's comment, uh, when you say main care, are you talking about Medicaid? That's correct. Yes, so that what we're talking is right. the indigent support That's un correct. under uh, Medicaid, also known as main care. So those right. patients are not eligible so you may have an empty bed, but that's, that's being reserved to take care of the risk that you'd have a, a patient become a nursing home patient. That's correct, because if we didn't have that bed, we are contractually bound to provide that care and pay for it in another nursing home setting. Okay, and, and I think we're dealing with 52 units uh, here. Uh, how many people do you expect that will represent? And how old, what's the age range that we're talking about? Uh, we're projecting, and this may sound a little bizarre, but forgive me, about 1.75 occupants per dwelling unit. So that accounts for the fact that um, three quarters of the occupants will come in as couples. A quarter will come as, in as single individuals. So we're somewhere in probably in the low 80s in terms of the number of residents that we will serve um, at the Meadows location. To contrast that, we're serving right now in independent living about 260 residents. So we're really looking at um, somewhere around uh, a little less than a third increase in the number of independent living residents by virtue of adding these 52 accommodations. And, and, and I want to point this out because this is really important and it speaks to the contract zone and the amendment issue. Many of the services that residents at the Dorado site will receive will be received at the 15 Piper Road site. So there's an inextricable link between the two campuses, if you will. The service package includes services that will only be provided at 15 Piper Road. And I'm really asking these questions because there's questions about, and you've covered some of them, lighting, noise. Yes. And, and, and so the, the adverse impact 
on the neighborhood and realize that yes. the land could be developed in another fashion, so we can't take it as it stands. But uh, what are we talking about for the age that uh, we is projected to yeah. occupy these? We expect the average age of move in to be in the low to mid 70s. So probably somewhere between 71 and 75 on average. We are, um, over the last few years, our wait list, which has, which has grown considerably, mm -hmm. the average age is, has actually been reduced from 75 to about 71. So we are seeing, we are clearly seeing a trend toward younger, more engaged seniors. Um, Couple and, questions and those, Jim, those, related to sorry. The, is that you have a related question? Go right uh, to the wait list and also the uh, uh, what if effect it might have on uh, addressing a wait list. Go right ahead. I'm sorry, I'm building on your point. Thanks, Bill. What is the current wait list in terms the, of number? The of current wait list includes 190 deposits. Now, each of those depositors, and a depositor may be a single person or a couple, put down. 10% of the proposed entrance fee. So it's more than just a list of interest. These are folks that have expressed a genuine and serious desire in moving to Piper Shores. I will tell you in the last five years, the wait list um, has moved from about 75 to 190. We expect to be over 200 probably by the end of the first quarter of 2019. So in terms of, of actual weight, depending upon accommodation and desire, perhaps four to nine years. Wow. And could you speak, just building on that, uh, to, you know, do people normally enter at an independent uh, living level? Um, yes. And, and what, can you estimate what, yes. what effect building uh, the meadows would have on the wait list? And and yes. Um, it, the way a community like Piper Shores operates is that the residents who garner the benefit that I referred to earlier of the, the life care services all enter at an independent living level of care. So it's either an apartment or a cottage or a duplex in this particular case. We do actuarial studies and um, population projections. So for example, if you're a 79-year-old single female, we expect you to have a life expectancy of 12 years. Eight of those years are expected to be in independent living, two in assisted living, and two in skilled care. So those population projections are used in terms of projecting utilization. Right now, we're seeing about a 10% annual turnover of independent living units. So what that means with 200 units of independent living, about 20 names come off of that wait list each year. But we're seeing a net increase with more than 20 joining the list on an annual basis. Thank you. Very helpful. Last question. Last question. <laughs> the, uh, uh, I thought it was referenced that the architect was going to address this, but I thought uh, Mr. Jones is representation of the size and scale of the, I think it's called the commons building? Uh, the, the hybrid building, which yeah, includes, hybrid building. includes a common space. It, it made it sound like it was enormous. Uh, and so I wanted to ask if that was a pretty accurate depiction of, the since I've heard neighbors complain about this is going to be a very, very yes. large structure. Yes, I mean, we've heard the plan at the planning board meeting, there were people talking about a seven-story building, 100 feet tall. The reality is, is that going back and revisiting, based upon the November planning board meeting, we have reduced the measurable height from about 50, I think it was 55 to 40 feet. It was mentioned earlier, the current contract zone on the existing Piper Shores community has a buildable height of 39 feet. So if you want to see the height of the proposed building, come over to 15 Piper Road and look at the three-story apartment building. Within 12 inches, that will give you the, the projected height. But, but I think he's also talking about the footprint. It's not just the height. It's how big the building is. That's correct. Uh, the, the other thing that I would ask you to do is, right now, on the existing campus, there are two wings of 80 apartments on each wing. We are proposing... 12 
a commons building with four units above the commons building and another 12. That will give you some sense. Uh, we can dimensionalize that for the benefit of council and the, the planning board. It is a much more modest structure than I, I think it has been characterized by, uh, by others. <laughs> Last question. Go. So we don't know the square footage of the building. We'll ask footprint. the architect yeah. that question. Yeah. Yeah. Footprint square footage. Uh, no. <laughs> How many square feet is the 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 footprint of the building? Well, we can give you the exact numbers. I don't want to spit it all in. Within 500 square feet or 1,000 square feet? Do we plus or minus 2,000 square feet? Or? I got to give you the exact number. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. We'd, we'd, we'd rather share that exact number. Yeah. Yeah. Right. To, to compare building sizes to any building you want, you know, in your yeah. whole Scarborough area. It's an actual satellite photograph. Keep going backwards. It's in Will's sense. So, I mean, I mean just the, backwards, backwards, so the visual backwards, is almost, that backwards, one building going, is almost. Keep going back, back, back. <coughs> You're getting there. There. No, no one more. Where did I see that? I think that's the end. It's in the that's balloon photo. I think we ran out of helium on that trip. Uh, so I think we've gone we'll, way over on our time. I, so if you can, we'll if, look for it. Can I just summarize, if I may, take just a few moments yet to talk about community benefit because that was one of our charges, and and I think uh, Miss Katarina was focusing on that earlier. Clearly, we believe one of the benefits of the project is senior housing availability. Um, I talked about how many people have expressed an interest. I, I just want to, to be clear, if you don't know this, um, we're already the oldest state in the union, demographically. We're not going to get any younger by any stretch. We're only also on the leading edge of the explosion of the baby boomers. These are people born between 1946 and 1964. If you look in this room, most of us, with a few exceptions, are part of the baby boom generation. These will be, and I include myself in this group, these will be the folks that will be looking for senior housing in the coming years. Uh, so we need to be prepared as a state. I think Scarborough needs to be prepared as a region. It's in the comprehensive plan. There are numerous references to housing for seniors. Second, one of the community benefits we believe is that the applicant has stated that the entire development at the Meadows would be a taxable entity, taxed at the current millage rate and the assessed value. We don't know what that will be because obviously there's not been an assessment. Speculation might suggest that that would be perhaps in the area of $500,000 a year. We don't know. I'm just offering that as an order of magnitude number. The other thing I would point out with regard to the revenue source that the project provides to the greater community, the return on investment for the tax dollars coming out of Piper Shores at present is significant. No Piper Shores residents use the schools. Piper Shores uses little municipal services. The extent to which we use municipal services is EMS, fire department, with an occasional police cruiser. The trail system, as alluded to earlier, the project includes a commitment in perpetuity to maintain and access walking trails. Most of the walking trails are already in the setback area. They are protected by virtue of being in the setback. Any area that is not in the setback, we would make sure would be protected um, with the appropriate legal remedy. The trails are an important part of uh, community life and community benefit. We have folks in this room tonight who do not live at Piper Shores but take full benefit of the access to Piper Shores walking trails and roads. And we're pleased about that. That same opportunity would be extended at the Meadows property. 
One of the intriguing thoughts about this is by maintaining the trails, we believe we can partner with Camp Ketcha and the land trust to provide up to a two mile walking path that would enable folks to walk from the land trust property through Camp Ketcha, through the meadows, across the street, and ultimately to Higgins Beach. That's a remarkable, powerful benefit to the town of Scarborough. The final thing that I would say with regard to the trail system is if the McDonald's choose to sell the property to another developer, I think it's important to note that there is no guarantee that those trail systems will in fact be maintained um, at the expense of independent homeowners and that developer. We are assuring um, all involved that they would be maintained in perpetuity. We talked a little bit about the contribution to affordable housing. I don't think I have to belabor that, other than to say in 2015, when the contract zone was first amended, um, we did, and that was to add 30 units of assisted living, we made a $40,000 contribution to the affordable housing fee fund on behalf of that initiative. I I'd like to talk about a, a, an area that may not necessarily be evident to all, but that has to do with volunteer and volunteerism in this town. We have more than 70 organizations in the greater Scarborough area that our residents volunteer at. Very profound, very significant. We have more than 417 stated instances whereby residents have made donations to various organizations in Scarborough and this local area. Um, as an organization, we sponsor a number of organizations in Scarborough, and we believe that that represents part of our ongoing obligation and responsibility as being a good corporate citizen. We've also talked about the impact on community resources. Uh, there's no snow plowing on Piper Shores by the town. There's no road maintenance. Uh, we don't see a municipal vehicle at all, really, on the property. That's all on us. That would be on us at the uh, Meadows campus as well. And I guess the final point I would like to make is we really do believe that this plan is consistent with the comprehensive plan as it relates to the design of housing, the intent of housing, and so we believe that we're, we're extremely compliant and consistent with the intent of the, the comprehensive plan here in Scarborough. So we thank you for the opportunity. I know we went over, but um, we think that we have a considerable story to share. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I think at this point we're going to convene to the table, but do anybody need a bio break for the next five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Okay. So let's reconvene in about five minutes. Thank you. Well, there's, there's no tactically polite way to...
everybody. Thank you for a lengthy conversation. I think it was some good background. Um, maybe just as a start, though, I think there's some new faces and, and new council members and others. Maybe just go around and each council member and each of you can introduce each other. And so I'll go left. To, I'll start with Paul. Paul Johnson, town council. Don Hamill. Tom Ball, town manager. Jay Chase, planning director. Roger Bailey, planning board. Nick McGee, planning board. Robin Saunders, planning board. Rick Dupari, planning board. Rachel Hendrickson, planning board. Bill Donovan, town council. Jean Marie Caterina, town council. So thank you, everybody. I think the intent of this is just to kind of have an open-ended conversation and just kind of exchange comments back and forth. And, and so if anybody wants to lead off, uh, any, anybody have any questions, comments, observations? Well, I'm never shy, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, as I had just mentioned to you, Councillor uh, Chair Chair Hayes, um, it's it was very um, actually beneficial for us to sit here and listen to the policy discussion that took place because one of the biggest questions I had was amendment versus application mm -hmm. and how the process would work and whether it's due to being non-contiguous and 61 units versus 52 and where would we lie in that? So. Um, as um, Tom had said, you know, planning board, we're here to keep it to pretty much technical type things. So, so I think I have only three or four things, I guess, that I'd like to, to talk with you all about. Um, the first one is um, based on some of the <clears throat> concerns that we've got from um, uh, public comment periods, both tonight and at the planning board meetings that we've had in the past. We've had um, some citizens bring up issues regarding blasting and water quality issues due to the ledge and, and those types of things. And <clears throat> uh, based on my experience, the pre-blast survey that has ha has been done for the um, for the um, mining permit is not a suitable substitute for mm -hmm. a seismic analysis by a geotechnical engineer for some of the um, vibratory issues, mm -hmm. considering the fairly high-end residences that are in that area. Also, um, the pre-blast survey is not a suitable substitute for a hydrogeologic or subsurface analysis for potential water quality issues in this area. So that that's number one for me, was the pre-blast survey is not a suitable substitute for some of the, I think, technical reports that are needed. The second thing I want to comment on is traffic impacts and that they're only proposing a 3% increase. Um, I'm wondering if... You know, I'm, I'm thank you all for for include you know for doing going through the the exercise of saying 52 units times 1.75 per people per unit. You know, so we know it's about around 80 people, and you know, does that include the the staff that's needed to support those folks, and does that account for the increased traffic impacts for recreational from the trailhead and that type of thing? So I definitely have some traffic uh, concerns and. I was actually fairly disappointed to hear that one of the municipal services that they didn't cover as far as in the public benefit was, was roads. Mm -hmm. uh, Spurwink Road is, uh, we've heard from both the public, public comment period tonight and also at our last planning board meeting, that Spurwink Road is sort of needs some attention and it will only be exacerbated by this additional traffic and the additional construction and, and the like kind of a thing. So I guess I was a little bit disappointed to hear that sidewalks won't be included in any of this for public benefit and that um, the traffic study, you know, I'm, I, I just, it, it just isn't quite reconciling with me. The third thing that I wanted to provide a comment to you all on too that I'll be looking for at the next planning board meeting on Monday is, um, are those issues, but I guess I just wanted to sort of talk a little bit about the public benefit that I perceive too. Yeah. And um, uh, it would be interesting, I know they're saying that it's a huge tax revenue uh, or you know potential windfall for the town, but it would be interesting to compare this to an RF zone, like the two acres per single family unit and what the typical value is in that area type thing to see if, if this is uh, a windfall type of thing for the town. Um, I, I actually went through and saw some other public benefits that 
the team isn't taking credit for that I think they should. For example, some of the innovative design includes increased vegetative buffers, earthen berms, planted trees, setbacks, increased to, to promote privacy. Um, you know, a stormwater pond, I'd love to see that stormwater pond become an amenity, whether it's adding aeration to it so it becomes sort of like a fountain, something like that. But again, the biggest, um, you know, and they also had seven sensitivity to the building position. But I would really challenge um, the town council and staff and us as a planning board to whatever part we can to really push what the public benefit is. And it sounded like Councillor Katarina is already on that. And um, I, I would also see from a technical perspective, I'm going to it, some, some ways we could um, really preserve some unique or sensitive environmental features, whether it's habitat, whether it's um, doing some off-site improvements elsewhere. Um, agricultural, I mean, that, that's, that's in there too. You know, I was sad to see that there weren't maybe some, some gardens that were going to support the, the, the food, you know, that's growing there kind of a thing. Um, public access to water bodies, open land. I just feel like we can really max, if, if this is going to happen, we got to really hold some feet to the fire as far as the public benefit is concerned. And from a technical perspective, if you need help from finding any of those, let me know. Um, I think that was the extent of my comments, but if not, I'll review my notes and ask to be called on again. Thank wow, you. Wow, that was a great comment. Okay, thank yeah, you. Very thoughtful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, so for starters, I didn't think I was going to be able to make it tonight. Uh, luckily for the weather, school was canceled. My daughter's <laughs> concert's off until tomorrow. So um, I am here, but I had prepared ahead of time um, a kind of a written um, note, <laughs> some thoughts on this. And my approach um, was kind of really to tackle the two decisions that you guys, mm -hmm. as a council a joint body, have to make here tonight, and uh, two or three decisions, I suppose. And, and in my focus really was this comprehensive plan alignment, whether or not it does. And um, to the applicant's credit, there's certainly things in our comprehensive plan that it does align with. Um, but on the other side of that is there are certainly aspects of this proposal where it doesn't align. And at some point in time, we have to make a decision as to which you give more weight to, mm -hmm. what carries more weight for, for us as a community. And I kind of highlighted a passage out of the comp plan citing that this area was envisioned to remain kind of a rural um, development type of area, hence the RF zoning it currently carries. Um, now there, you know, to, to summarize, there are ways that you can kind of develop around that. Um, one is that single family homestead at two acres a lot. Um, and it would give you roughly 19 homes in there, single family homes. Um, but it does also allow for cluster development. But it also carries with that cluster development a provision for um, with the benefit of larger open space lands. Mm -hmm. And I've I heard um, the applicant allude to significant open space lands. I, I don't see any sort of anything on this current property that's being set aside in either a conservation aspect or an open space preserve, or anything like that. They, they have claimed that they will maintain a trailhead or the trail that currently exists and um, some of the more natural features to the back. But it's not necessarily carrying that same weight as here are 20 acres that mm -hmm. this town or the public can now use. So when I have to evaluate, and this is for speaking for me personally, when I have to evaluate whether you know, the, be you know, the benefit versus the risk here, um, I'm going to land, I'm going to go on the land use side of things because you can't, it's harder to reclaim land. It, mm -hmm. Once you develop it, you can't really ever maintain those natural features. Yeah. So uh, for me, when I, when I, you know, was push came to shove, and, and I really did struggle with this, uh, kind of going through what we had written um, for our guidance and our ordinances mm -hmm. and, and our comp plan, um, I, you know, I landed towards, let, you know, on the more conservative route, which is the land use kind of trumps what the potential benefit of this development looks like here. And... And part, part of that decision, too, weighing into it is you can actually put nursing care facilities here in its current RF zoning. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can do some of this cluster development in its current RF zoning. And the major difference is they want to do it on a, a maximum scale, mm -hmm. 52 units to 61 units, whereas you could put 19 there and still care for the elderly, still have elderly facilities. You could still have duplex mm -hmm. housing. It's just the scale of it. Right. So um, that was the first point. The second 
point that I know you guys have to address at some point here is this public benefit aspect to it. Now, <clears throat> I, I am going to, I have to editorialize a little. I think our, the way we have our documents written here in town, I think it's a really low bar on the public benefit side, mm -hmm. well, the criteria that we use. Mm -hmm. And over time, I would encourage the council maybe to look at what we would consider um, <laughs> as a public benefit, because some of those things, yes, they check the box. Mm -hmm. it, it aligns, it aligns, it aligns. But is it really, you know, and, and in started, substance, we've, we've started you know, conversation. and yeah. uh, I think w one of those things that that really kind of got me was, yes, a hundred and twenty thousand dollar donation to an affordable housing and is nothing to necessarily sneeze at. But we also need to acknowledge that we're putting in up to 61 units and you can't build a single home for anyone right. with one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So I, I think you have to take it with a grain of salt. Yes, they check a lot of the boxes on the public benefit side, and if I was forced to vote based on the <coughs> current documents were written, I'd agree. They they check that they, they clear that very low bar. Um, however, there is also language in our comprehensive plan that I think this um, council, if you're not aware of already, it did state in that section of town um, that the increased density of residential use growth areas should be offset by a development transfer program that assures the land in rural areas will remain undeveloped either through an actual transfer of development rights or through the payment of a development transfer fee to a fund of rural land conservation. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully in your deliberations this comes up. Instead of an affordable housing component to their donation, if you guys do push this forward and you feel like there's enough benefit, I would actually encourage you to consider it to be more to the Scarborough Land Trust or some sort of conservation effort because that is what the 2006 comprehensive plan does see this as a vision, as a possible offset for any development does occur in these type of areas. I think that would be one area that you should be looking at when you discuss your public benefit aspect. Um, outside of that, I heard a lot of my personal thoughts being echoed probably from the audience, a lot of from you and the council as well. Um, and I would lastly like just to point out that I believe the applicant um, is a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, I have no ill will towards this applicant. Their proposal is beautiful. Is it right for the space they want to put it in is really the ultimate question. And, um, you know, I think regardless of what happens, if this goes forward and it comes to us on the planning board, we as a team, I, I have no doubts that all of us will handle this um, and take care of those remaining elements with the most professionalist and, and an unbiased view. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if I could uh, weigh in, I'm I'm in substantial agreement uh, with my colleagues. Um, the definition of public benefit it basically is subject to interpretation. It's in the eye of beholder. I could go down this list, uh, the guidelines for the council in determining public benefits, and I could argue positively on most of these, and then I could turn around and argue that it doesn't meet. Uh, on most of these. It, it really is in the eye of the beholder. Um, one observation is if that property does go to single family uh, with 19 houses, the chances are those are going to be four bedroom houses uh, and at least 80 people living there with, with substantially more traffic, I would imagine, than what we have now because the kids will be going to school. Uh, the teenagers will be going to work. Um, there will be a lot more traffic onto, onto Spurwink Road. Uh, saying that, I think we have a problem in general with Spurwink Road. Mm -hmm. And on the, on the board, we've had discussions in the <coughs> past, do we put all the blame on the last person to apply for space on the road? Uh, and that's, that's not fair. Um, it's not necessarily fair to back up and go to everybody else and say, well, now you all have got to kick in. But it is a, it is a town issue. Um, we did ask that they build a crosswalk or allow people to a trail for folks from the meadows to cross over and onto the trail. I, I just have a visual of some of our older folks crossing, <laughs> trying to get across <laughs> Spurwink Road uh, during tourist season. And it is... It is, by and large, I would bet the folks from um, from away who are who are speeding through there. Um, but it is a concern, uh, and even a three percent increase in a road that's already problematic uh, provides provides more of a problem. Certainly during during the summer, I'm concerned about the difference of the 61 houses requested or units requested versus 52. Um, 
I, I just, I just don't like to buy something where I don't know where some of it's coming from, mm. uh, or what it might be. And I did hear from one of the uh, abutters who commented tonight that there's a cottontail habitat. Uh, and if that's what's at the back of the property and with it's no longer on the slide I was looking at, um, there, there we go, the recreation trails, existing vegetation, the, uh, the satellite view um, did show what looked like cottontail habitat. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me if this is something that's going through, uh, that now is the time to decide that that property uh, might well be what comes to the town or the land trust or camp catcher or however you want to look at it. If it has that habitat, we, we do not want to uh, open it up in the future uh, for another nine houses. Simply don't want to do that. Um, so I would uh, ask that you take a look at that. I, I've got um, a couple of observations from the guidelines. And one of the things that, that I heard is that it would recreate either direct or indirect employment opportunities. Um, and I haven't heard how many jobs are going to be developed, and I haven't heard from the developer what efforts they would make to, to ensure that it's the Scarborough residents who have those jobs. We hear a lot about folks from away coming to the uh, to the the facility it's a it's a beautiful facility but certainly job fair can be developed to hire people from Scarborough to work there that's a direct rather than an indirect benefit something they can take a look at I'm also concerned about the the issue around affordable housing hmm. Scarborough needs affordable housing for seniors and I look, when I look at something like this, I, I look at the whole system. And they start to talk about promoting the diversity of affordable housing um, as one of the things we should be looking at. So a senior from Scarborough moves into an affordable housing unit at Piper Shores. And that frees up, by and large, a single family home, likely to be modest. Hmm and very likely then to be affordable to a new family, um, somebody just graduating from the Scarborough School, somebody working in town. It actually starts to, oh, who may have been living in an apartment which has now opened up. So right. it, when you're talking about senior residences, you're really talking about a whole stream of changes in development and affordable housing. Uh, I've always thought that the amount of money that Scarborough uh, requests, extracts from developers, well, however, whatever word you want to use, is extremely modest and is not helping us. It is not really developing the affordable housing. Now, in terms of um, I, on the more positive area, um, we've really been seeing more and more the concept of pocket neighborhoods uh, that allow a larger space for the open area larger green space, larger place for people to walk, for kids to run across a meadow if it's in a, if it's in a different sort of housing development. Um, and this is a well thought out development. Uh, there's been questions as we know about the uh, hybrid building. I will tell you, I really love the building. It is in the main vernacular it looks like a camp of writ large. It blends into the tree area. It really is suited for the ground and the, and the territory. Um, and it is not, as we've been seeing, seeing recently, big white square blocks being <laughs> built. Uh, it is really um, a it goes beyond the attempt to meet minimum standards, as one developer has insisted on. <laughs> so what we, see, what we see there is the sort of building and thoughtfulness fitting into the land and fitting into the main vernacular that we should look for in other places. Uh, so 
I love the design. I'm not convinced uh, about the public benefit. I think I could interpret it as being there or as not enough as being there. So I don't envy you the job that you have, but I will echo what, again, what my colleagues have said, and that is um, if you say go ahead, we will make sure this is the best damn development out there for seniors. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I guess it's me and Raj. Raj, you want to go? Um, sure. Um, I, I came to this workshop um, thinking that we're, you know, we're going to be basically talking about the comp plan and the benefits and not getting into uh, the aesthetics and all the other things that the planning board normally gets into. Um, and when I looked at this project, I think, I think you guys have a difficult decision to make regarding these two particular areas. Um, whenever you, you know, I find it interesting, whenever we're confronted with a situation like this, and I respect your, your, uh, your bias and, and their concerns, I think they're very legitimate. But the problem is we don't hear from the whole town. And this is a project that could really benefit the whole town. Um, you know, for, strictly just from a tax point of view, it's a, it's a real benefit. And um, so, I, 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 you know, I'm looking at it um, from, from that point of view as well. Um, I, um, I, I think the project, when I first saw it, I thought it made, it, it looked really nice. I think it's done well, it's, it's well thought out and everything. Um, I took a ride up on New Newcomb Ridge, and I could certainly understand the abutters' concern there. There's, there was no trees, but they're going <coughs> to accommodate that, I think. Um, and uh, you know, you, like one of my colleagues said, uh, there could be homes there, single-family homes. You know, and and I suspect there'll be much more traffic with fewer single-family four-bedroom homes than there will be. You got to keep in mind who's living in these places. The, I even questioned at the at the board meeting how far these people are going to be walking. You know, I don't see them walking across the street to go down to the main building. I, I see the facility having a van taking them there. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's because I can relate to that age. <laughs> um, but so I, I'm. I like the project itself. I do have. You know, if I was in a butter and I moved, I've seen this on, on other um, planning board uh, issues too, where people buy property someplace and then all of a sudden, like in a TBC zone, and all of a sudden um, a brewery can go in, you know, mm -hmm. and they don't realize it. But, that, you know, that, well, that's a different situation. But the fact is, people are buying into something, they're buying uh, with expectations of where they're going to be living, and all of a sudden they, they could be even like cluster homes out, out in the countryside. Um, so I, I, I can see that concern that people have. Um, uh, so I'm, I, I don't envy the position you guys are going to be in, because you're going to have to make a decision on this. but. And, and, I, and I saw our role as basically once you guys make the decision, then that's where we come into play and we basically uh, abide by our guidelines at that point, you know? Um, so I, I don't feel that it's really my responsibility to, to provide my personal, you know, mm -hmm. at, at this point. Yeah. So. That's fair. All right, Rick. <laughs> All right. I'm just getting done now. All right, I like to go last because I kind of piggyback on what everybody else has said. I don't have anything else to say. Um, you know what? I'm going to start with um, what Robin was talking about and the blasting report. Um, and I've gone through that. And, and um, yeah, I don't think it's quite adequate for what, what they're doing and, and what would make the abutters feel better. Um, you know, maybe I should start out by saying that I really want to applaud the applicant for reaching out to the abutters because we at planning board see on several occasions where the applicants don't do that. Mm -hmm. And if they had just done that and gone out and said, hey, this is what I want to do, what do you think? It would have saved a lot of time and trouble. So um, I applaud that the applicant has, has done that. Um, it, it sounds like that they're making some progress, but they... they there are some folks that 
don't think they quite heard everything that they've said. So I would encourage them to keep doing those, those meetings. Um, so jumping back to the blasting report, some of the concerns that I heard were regarding wells. Um, and this, this, this pre-blast pre study that you do in the blasting, I think that you have to do a um, kind of like a pre and a post blast thing. So I built a house um, on Ledgefield Circle in South Portland. And uh, the developer did a lot of blasting, believe it or not, on Ledgefield Circle because there's quite a bit of ledge. Um, and what they did was they actually went in and um, it was a brand new road, but when they put in the last couple of houses and they hadn't put in the foundations, they did do some blasting. So they went in and um, actually videoed the basements. Now, I'm not saying that this has to be done in this case because of the proximity of the houses, but it's one thing that that one of the, the pre and the post thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is around the wells. Um, there's some concern, what does blasting do to a well? And you, if you talk to a hydrologist, I think they'll tell you that the, the results of blasting may not be seen right away. Right. And, and that's a major concern. If I was on a well, that would be one of my biggest concerns. So I think that you know, they need to take a look at the water quality before the blasting, after the blasting, maybe a year after the blasting, two years after the blasting, whatever a hydrologist um, tells them makes sense. And, and if there is an issue, it, I think it really comes down to the applicant saying, look, I've got these folks that, that still aren't quite on board. How can I get them on board? And, and this, this um, particular project is being fed by a public water line. I saw it somewhere here. It's got a 12-inch main going in. So, uh, or the, the Portland Water District has a 12-inch main going down and I'm sprawling. So if that hybrid building is being fed by public water, and there's a problem with the wells. Maybe they just say, hey, look. Mm -hmm. They just have to, I think they have to take it a step further when it comes to the wells. The wells are a main concern for people. If you have a crappy well, you can't sell your house. If you can't sell your house, your property value is gone. Yeah. Yeah. So I think they need to look at that. And, and you know, that needs, needs to be something that needs to be considered. So um, I think I'm done with the Robins. <laughs> Although, I, and I'll jump on to Rachel. So Ra Rachel talked about that, and Nick as well, talked about that area that we can see back in there. And I don't know what that area, I don't know if that's dry land, wet land, what it is, but it's a big chunk of land, and it's got a road going to it. So my concern would be, is that going to be phase six? Right. Mm -hmm. right. The, um, right. The additional and, units. And it, it, do we need to address that now or address that later? Maybe if it's, if it, maybe we can't, Maybe the applicant's not prepared to say, okay, you know, if we can build this, we'll, we'll leave that green space and we'll let the public use it. I'm not saying they're at, but it would help the planning board and it would, I think it would help this town approve this project to help, help you make your decision easier if that's something that they can say. Um, you know, I'm not real concerned about the rabbits, tell you the truth. It's actually why you shouldn't say that on TV. But, you know what? I got rabbits. I got, Shame on you. I got mice. Nobody's watching anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I figured by this time they're all shut it off. But you know what? I live in Scarborough. I got rabbits. I got mice. I got raccoons. I got skunks that can't seem to figure out how to cross a road. Um, it's like they wait for the headlights, I swear to God. Um, but the green space would be nice. It'd be something that it would be something. It would be a public benefit. It would it help satisfy that criteria. Um, if 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 that's something that you know, now we've got the comprehensive plan and the public benefit going. And then you know I did. We talked a little about who talked about sidewalks. Someone talked about sidewalks. Um, come back to Robin. Sidewalks in front of that property. I understand that it's. That's, they, they, it may be seen as above and beyond, but it's another thing that contributes to public benefit. And, and if it's, it's a liability thing and they don't want to, um, you know, have put in those sidewalks and worry about the liability, maybe they could contribute some money to the town and the town could put in those sidewalks. Um, but if there were sidewalks there, I think that would, that would help us see this, the public benefit to this project. And it's, I don't think a sidewalk is, is, is there's a lot to ask there in that particular stretch of road just in front of what they own for property and maybe 
Um, so I'm just trying to see the public benefit along with the, the with the, I think it is in line with the comprehensive plan. But I'd like to see a little bit more public benefit, and I'd like to see the people behind me a little bit more happy about this project. Um, because if I lived there, I'd want to be a little more happy about this project. I think once they once the that comms building goes in, I know it looks like it's going to be big, but you know there's a lot of three-story houses in, in Scarborough now, and or so I don't I think I think it's going to bring property value up, which hopefully will be a good thing. But you know I don't know that for sure. But I don't necessarily have any issues with the, the project itself. I think it has a lot of good benefits. Um, but I'd like to see if they can, if we could get just a little bit more evident, immediate benefits. Um, of town. And I think that um, I think that's about about all I have. And if the seventy-one-year-olds do go walking, it would be nice to have that um, <laughs> crosswalk. We lived. We lived across the street from the Viking in Cape Elizabeth, and we forever saw what we used to call runners. My mom worked there, and she used to go chasing runners all the time, the old folks that wandered down the street. And, <laughs> oh. and, and we don't want old folks wandering. We don't want sidewalks. We don't want old folks wandering on the So I, that's, that's, that's all I have. But um, it was just reiterating everything else that you said. But. Peter? Um, can I ask Will a question? Yeah. Yeah. There you are. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, on the um, on the hybrid commons, when that was first before the planning board, and and we saw a visual from uh, Spurlink, yeah, my impression was that was in a low area, it's going to be located in a low area, and the reason I asked this question is Mr. Jones brought up the point that the commons is going to be located, situated on one of the highest points. Can you clarify that for me? Uh, it's not the highest point, but it is near the highest point. Okay. The land comes up from Spurwick, then it drops down to where that pond is. And then it comes back up to where the hybrid is. And then it <coughs> drops down towards the estates. So right around where that building is, behind it, is the highest point. So it's not at the highest point, but it's near the highest point. Okay. I mean, is the footprint of, of that building going to be pretty much where the house is now, right? Is that sort of where the uh, in front of it, this towards Spurwink yeah. and towards the left, yeah. looking from Spurwink. Do any counselors have any comments? Want to share any observations, thoughts, <laughs> concerns? <laughs> I'll be nice. No. <laughs> um, I, frankly, I think it's a well thought out plan as a plan goes. Um, I think that the building, the architecture of the buildings, I'm thrilled with. I, as Rachel pointed out, it'd be nice if some other developers would take a look at what's going on here. Um, I know one of the things when I first saw this plan was I was thinking, geez, what? It's too bad that pocket neighborhood couldn't be flipped so that it's not up against mm -hmm. the uh, Newcomb Ridge, but I'm assuming it has to do with terrain and mm -hmm. drainage and whatever. So. Yeah. Um, um, and again, you know, I'm concerned about density there, uh, and I absolutely get it, you know, and I, and I know when I've talked to a couple of people from the Newcomb Ridge, I said, well, you know, someone's going to buy that. It's prime real estate, and there are going to be however many houses come in there, 19, uh, could go in there. So do you want, you know, 19 houses in your typical, you know, four or five bedroom Six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand dollar house, um, and kids, and the and the, and cost to the town and whatnot. Or, you know, do you want to work with Piper Shores um, regarding their density and whatever, and looking at that and public good, where you know there's some control over it because the fact that it is a contract zone. So I mean, and that's the that's been the thing I've been weighing. Um, but as I mentioned when I spoke before, my, the only thing that would convince me to, to vote for this is if I see some substantial public good, because it is an RF zone. I'm in real estate. People buy their houses with the expectation that the zoning, and I'm not going to commit, I hate contract zones anyway, I'll be honest with you. 
because uh, they're after the fact and they get their legal spot zoning. Um, but so you know, weighing that's hard. So I'm going to need a lot of something to go with it. But anyway. I guess I'm struggling with, it's not a nursing home, it's, it's an apartment complex, I mean, it's a duplex unit complex. It's all individual living, it's all independent living. With the exception of where people are getting their services, it's almost as if it's Piper Shores in name alone across the street. And I, I struggle with if it was any other developer in here. I, and I know that kind of takes the public good out of it, so that might not be fair. But I, you know, if we had, if we had USM or somebody that came and wanted to put 24 units with a dining hall attached in that same place, I mean, we could. That would I feel like that'd be an emphatic no right off the get go. So I'm struggling with, you know, I feel like it's just in, it, it's a name alone, and it, it's it's when it comes down to it, it it's no different than a than a developer, than an independent private developer that wants to come in. I think the plan's beautiful too. I think the hybrid, I love the building. I, I really mm -hmm. do. You know, if we could shift the whole thing over 500 feet, I, I, I think everybody might be happy. I could be wrong, but. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, I'm just thinking out loud, but that's exactly what I'm struggling with right now is, is what is it? And it's, it, I know things that it's not. Council Dunham? Uh, yeah, this is tough. Uh, I think presently I see the case for a contract zone falling short. Uh, and to get me to support it will take a, a bunch of things to happen. Mm. Uh, first and foremost, protection for the neighborhood. Uh, when I was out there, I was just amazed with Bob Dulac. I mean, just, it's a pastoral setting. Mm. But I kept having to tell myself, Think of it as having 18 single-family residences right. on it. Uh, uh, and I counterbalance that with my respect for Piper Shores, which does nothing but first-rate development. So uh, that, that presented a problem for me. But it doesn't change the fact that uh, while I can, and I think the case for um, the comprehensive plan, compatibility with the comprehensive plan, uh, was made out well by uh, the applicant's counsel. I think the argument by the neighbors was also very well presented. So uh, that one is a tough one. Uh, but at this point, I would say to the planning board, the, the protection of the neighborhood, that screening uh, and, and mounding and barrier has to be wonderful. I thought Paul Johnson had a good idea. It ought to go in first mm -hmm. before before we start doing uh, much else. Uh, the light pollution issue they addressed. Mr. Adamovich uh, addressed it. That has to be because there is there's a gorgeous night sky out there, and, yeah. and they ought to have it after the, whatever happens out there. Uh, and I worry about that. Uh, if you have 18 single-family houses of 4,000 square feet each, whether you would have that. But here, you can control it. It's one of the reasons why contract zones have a limited appeal in that you can set some pretty rigorous uh, limitations. Uh, <clears throat> nailing down the permanency of the trail system. Uh, this whole business about being able to move them around uh, <coughs> gives me the willies. <coughs> I would want to be able to have confidence that the neighborhood, which will be the primary beneficiary of this, gets what uh, we're, we're hearing. So that would be an important factor for me. Uh, I can't vote for a 61 uh, unit place. Mm -hmm. it's the, I think the density is pushing it at 52. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I would, when this comes back up, whenever it does come back, I would move to amend to make it 52. Uh, and case sera, sera, 
I mean, it doesn't mean they can't file for an uh, application to amend 10, 15 years from now when the 52 units are built and, and everyone sees it and can react to it and says they are proposed to go here, and then you can react to it. That backspace, uh, uh, I, do, I agree with the comments about open space. That backspace, if it's only going to be 52 and they've identified the 52, well, I'd encourage them to open up that backspace. Did I hear right that Mr. Adamovich said that the sort of commons area, there, just talking about open space, was open to the public? Yes. I thought I heard that. Uh, because I like the cluster. I really like the fact that they're, they're <coughs> keeping it low and keeping it small in those areas nearest to the neighborhoods. Uh, and having a lot of open space that is going to be charming, I think, when it's, when it's, when it's preserved. Uh, I think the, the impact uh, on this, besides being of concern to me on the neighborhood, is just generally uh, I would want to uh, uh, amend the tax status uh, this is an amendment. So everything that goes on over at Piper Shores as it exists is now part of this. Uh, and there is uh, a Holbrook House. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the right number is, but I do know that a right number, and I would look to the advice and, and recommendations of my fellow counselors on this, that uh, uh, a resolution <coughs> of the Holbrook uh, value uh, assessment and taxability should be made a part of this agreement. It's tax issues are already addressed in the draft that was presented to us. So there's nothing that says we can't, and it is an amendment to the totality of the property. So uh, I think Holbrook uh, should be on the table and should be resolved in a manner that is appropriate because I do believe that our 20,000 per affordable housing unit is way low. Mm -hmm. I see the people from Portland every month at the Metro Regional Coalition, and I ask them, How, what have you got? He says, we've got several million. Where's your $100,000? Uh, and, and people pay it because they'd rather do that, and I have no doubt I, that it would not be a good fit to say to Piper Shores, add affordable housing. They have a model, a business model, and it's, and it's established. But they're also very successful. And I think that uh, uh, it's a win-win uh, in that case in terms of, of the finances. Because I believe, and I've had this discussion with the town manager a dozen times, that, and he has convinced me, have affordable housing be pursued by those who love to do it. They're passionate about it. The investors of the world, the Habitat for Humanities of the world, and leverage uh, Bessie Commons of the world. We've got a lot of people in town who are very committed to affordable housing, and I think we should be tapping into those resources uh, and trying to use good corporate citizens like uh, every time we've had a contract zone, Beacon, three quarters of a million, this, uh, and so it really can contribute to it. And, uh, uh, and, and the Scarborough Land Trust comments, I completely agree that that would, that would, be, that would be helpful. Uh, so I think we can get there to yes. I think I can get to yes. But it just looks to me like it's going to take a lot of work by the planning board, a lot of work by the councilors <clears throat> to assess, assess this. Uh, I agree with the blasting <clears throat> that uh, I would worry tremendously, uh, having had to put in a new well at Higgins Beach five years ago. Uh, uh, I tested it then, and I tested it a month ago, just because I wanted to make sure the water quality had maintained itself. So I completely agree with the concerns about that. The sidewalk issue, <clears throat> I don't know. I drive up and down Spurwink Road probably six times a day. 
so uh, no one's more familiar with, with it. It, it is uh, relatively high. The thing that makes it dangerous isn't, I've hit deer twice on that road. Oh, <laughs> it, it, it's that it's a straight shot, uh, and it's got a 45 mile an hour up around Camp Ketcha, so it's fairly high speed. Uh, I could see, and I had explored with the uh, Department of Public Works, their thoughts, expensive, uh, but uh, the suggestion was made that we ought to look at widening the shoulder, that there could be some shoulder widening done there that would be a much more affordable option. I only say it so that you'd be thinking that, okay, why don't we look, we've got, and we do put upon you guys, and I respect you greatly for the work that you guys have been putting in in recent years. So those are, uh, Tom, are we going to have traffic impact fees uh, 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 applied to here as we would with any development? Unless for some reason council writes it into the contract zone that they wouldn't apply, they will be. But they would be applied. Yes. Okay. Good. I think that's it for me. Just, just a comment regarding uh, the, speed, the speed limit. Uh, on a transportation committee um, last year, when we were talking about the brewery out on 114, there was discussions about lowering the um, speed limit. And we were concerned that if DOT comes out and does a study, uh, I think this is what we're asking. My colleagues on the transportation committee with me. Um, and they detect the speed limit is, say, 50 miles. People are going 50 miles an hour. They'll actually raise it. Right. So yeah. you, don't, you don't want to go down that road, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, I had one last thing. Uh, that uh, I appreciate that the neighborhood sees this and goes, whoa, yeah. and opposes it. But what I want them, and I appreciate that that view is probably not going to change. But I don't want them to miss the opportunity to tell us, every single thing that you think ought to be done if it does get approved. Because I will go to bat on anything that uh, seems at all reasonable. Yeah. And if I could just clarify, um, Councillor Donovan, with um, the sidewalk doesn't necessarily have to be completely adjacent to the roadway. It could be sort of like a trail mm. off the side of the road, sort of like we have on Highland Avenue um, in my neighborhood, you know, where it's sort yeah. of off the side of the road kind of a thing. So That's a good point. In between. And the other thing that I wanted to um, bring up is, is there any way we can add a multiplier to the affordable housing? Because it is a contract zone, and this is prime real estate right next oh, to the beach. Yeah. So why not add a multiplier to the affordable housing? And then lastly, I think it would be an interesting exercise, too, to see if if this is consistent with the draft 2018-19 comp plan, to see if there are if is anything that we're missing um, as we're in the process of updating. Can I ask a quick question of Jay? If this were not going to fly for pipe shores, I noticed up there they have put a conventional IRF subdivision. Can the planning board require whoever develops it to do cluster housing then? So in our RF zoning, we have a requirement that if a lot meets a certain threshold, and there's four or five of them in right. here, the one that we typically see is whether a property has an acre or more of wetlands, and, and, and I don't recall offhand, although I actually see up there it has four acres of wetlands. So this would hit the, the, the requirement that would be cluster subdivision. So lots would be, um, at least half the area would need to be maintained as open space. It would be what we call density neutral. So the number of units that you could build under conventional right. development can still be built. But in lieu of, or because half the lots are, or half the area is now open space, the minimum lot size goes from 80,000 right. square feet to 30,000 okay. square feet. Um, so it allows sort of reduction in uh, the, num the amount of road that needs to be developed um, and the amount yeah. of land that needs to get be used for the development overall. And one other quick question, <laughs> I'm sorry, it has to do with development. Can um, water and sewer be brought into Newcomb Ridge or to, I, I can't remember, I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. I can't remember. on septic and whatever too? I don't Is know there any reason that it there, could... There, there's it no could zoning be. provision that would limit the requirements. Oh, I think you need to blast. blast. I, I think that... Oh, okay. I wasn't sure there was a lot of legend there. Subsurface. Okay. But from, yeah. 
All right. JJ, just a kind of a follow up question. It was going to be a question I had that kind of follows up on what Robin asked. I think the last time we had a conversation, we asked whether in the, the draft of the comprehensive plan now, and, and this is supposed to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, is there, was there any pressure, any comment from any community input about looking to change green spaces and rural zoning and those types of things that would inform us that, that this is what the community wanted? I think you said no, you didn't yeah, see I, any. Yep, I think the, so, the, 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 the future land use plan is, is relatively unchanged. There's some tweaks or, and what have you, yeah. but by and large, sort of the growth zones have been identified and sort of the, you know, the low growth um, areas are, remain consistent, so. So it kind of reinforces, so Robin was saying, if anything's changed, and it sounds like as it relates to what we have in front of us. Yeah, I would say, I, I think maybe it was the point that Nick raised, you know, I think the, the real question with consistency with the comp plan sort of is weighing that balance between what the future land use plan says and what the other goals of the comprehensive plan are, and that ultimately is <coughs> you normalize it at your feet. Yes. Don, you need I, I've done several 360s on this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. You're open. You're open. Where are you right now? I started, I started very positive. I, I'm, uh, uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife's mom was at Piper Shores for 10 years and moved through all three phases there. And it was a terrific experience. And first class organization, mm -hmm. right. the, the, the work that they do is outstanding. Now, the quality of the plan is terrific. Um, there are a lot of positives. And so I started there, and I had a hard time moving off that. But as, but as looking back to the beginning, um, I really question how we get down the road so far on, a men, on an amendment versus an application. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that still sticks in my craw. Mm -hmm. And some way, somehow, we've got to stop doing that. We've got to mm -hmm. stop commissioning and making decisions at the outset that set us literally down a road where we're here now six months later, we shouldn't be here at all. So that that I have a real hard time with. There's no fix to it. I've gone back and forth to think about what should the remedy be, what could it be. There is none. There is none. But the other the other comments I think are terrific. I mean, I love the technical folks. I, I'm the liaison to the planning board. I'm spending a lot of time with, uh, with this crowd, and I know the work ahead of them and the work that they do. Um, they're fixers, and they're, we could do this. We could do that. We can, you know, work with this. The plan is good. Uh, but I really like, you know, the plan's great, other than the fact that it's there, that it's being proposed where it is. But it shouldn't be there even in the first place as an RF zone. So. so I have, so I am very troubled by the concept of I could, you know, if this, then I could approve it. If you give me, you know, housing affordability, or you give me something else, and something else, and something else, and why are we, why are we, you know, going to that amount of effort and and wear and tear on everybody, considering what we have in front of us in terms of development in the town in general? Why, why would we, why would we spend, you know, any amount of additional time? So that's why I'm very troubled to hear a narrative to the effect that. You know, give me these things and let's make a deal. I, I'm I'm not there at all. So I, um, the other thing I'd say is that I just I've tried very hard to kind of um, level the scales. I come up short on affordability, but even even beyond that, it's a it's a matter. It's not even a matter of affordability. It's a matter of accessibility, mm -hmm. accessibility to services. These services that Piper offers are essentially not accessible except to a very small handful of people who are situated a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I heard the statistics, but I'm still not a believer that most of them are from Maine and many of them are from, from Scarborough. You know, I grew up in upstate New York, so I'm not, a, I'm from away as well, but um, <laughs> I, you know, if it ties back to the, the community benefit, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling uh, not good about the fact that that you know, if it could be really accomplished or not. Um, I also liked what uh, Nick had to say about RF zones. Many of the things that are important to us, preserving the character of this area. I mean, how many contract zones are there? We tried, we talked about there being only a handful, but you know what? Every time you turn around, here's another one, and another <coughs> one, and another one. And we do one here in this area. How many contract zones are there down in this part of the area? It's not waterfront, but it's pretty darn close. And, and once we open the gate on that, 
people will be lining up for these right. because we can just run down the amendment road and just set them up and knock them down. And I think that is a very serious uh, direction that we have to be careful not to be heading in as a town. And when, when are we really going to say that, that we've listened to abutters and we've heard people talk about the quality of a neighborhood and the lifestyle and none of the abutters agree with this. Um, many of the citizens you know, would rather it not be there at all. When are we going to really say that we have preserved uh, as part of our comprehensive plan a commitment to preserve, maintain, and, and enhance marine and natural resources. It's just not happening. So some point, we have to start saying no. So I'm kind of at that point. I don't want to prolong it too much, but I just, because I was just about to say, I, I get, it's like we don't answer the question whether it's right or not, and then you slip <laughs> it transactional. And that, I'm really uncomfortable with that. I, I, I want to answer if this is right or not. I don't want to say, well, we all have this weird feeling, so let's slip into the transactional period. And that, you know, there's nine units that are mystery units, and we're looking at a big green space that clearly those nine units are going in that green. green. I, I, some, I just, I want to, I want to answer the question: Is this right? I don't want to answer. Well, it's not really right, but how can you buy us off? So I, and I know that's really blunt, and I, and but again, and I'm looking at nine mystery units and a green space where nine units would fit so nicely, and I, I wish that there was a little bit more. Honesty is the wrong word because I think everybody involved has been very honest, but I, I wish there was a little bit more direct conversation about what is the crux of this. And, and I want to conclude by saying very clearly, I don't think Newcomb Ridge, by any stretch of imagination, is entitled to the view of the night sky, to be completely honest with you, or their field. I think they've been completely spoiled for X amount of, I don't know, guys, and I, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's tough. That is tough. Uh, because I think, I, I think there's a possibility they're going to be careful. With, uh, they might get what they wish for, and they might regret it. And yeah, right. But you know what? That's not within my mind. That's not within the scope of this decision. And I guess where I'd be, and I really appreciate this this oh. forum because everything you said had made me think about something different. So that's oh. really good. I mean, I think it was a really rich dialogue. So thank you. I know it's been a long evening. So <laughs> we want to transition. Um, similar, and I echo all the comments that have been made. And I think Councilor Johnson probably put it. The, the clearest for me is, is this the right thing to do? And I really look at why do we have zoning? Why do we have green spaces? You know, and Nick, I think your words about, you know, sometimes land use needs to trump benefits. And I think we really, as Scarborough is so rapidly changing, I think that's something all of us should. So I really struggle with, is it really consistent, clearly consistent with the comp plan? And, and I'm not clear about that, just as I, I think others have echoed that. And two, I really struggle with what is the, the public benefit that could possibly, you know, outweigh some of the other things. And I'm coming up a little short at this point in time. And, and I think all these suggestions around the table are great suggestions and good things to weave into the conversation. But I'm uncomfortable of sort of where we find ourselves also, as you've kind of heard. And so that's where I, I'm still struggling with, is it consistent? Because that's, that's the threshold we need to use. And yeah. what is the public good? And we need to carefully think that. So I guess would anybody have any additional comments or suggestions? Or I know Tom and Jake have sat there very quietly and taken it all in. Do you guys have any clarity from us? Clarity, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <that's good. laughs> yeah. I guess I just want to make sure the council is aware, and everyone else for that matter, that you know these matters aren't a, a matter of right. Uh, this is a request. The council is fully with this with this authority to say no, with no reasons. Well, well, yeah, but I think when we said right, it's just balancing. No, correct. But there seemed to be a suggestion or a concern that we have a an obligation or a gun to our head that we've got to do something. You don't. Right. This, the applicant does not have a matter of right in this, That's right. In this discussion. That's right. It's your decision to say no, and you don't even need to provide a reason why. This council did that months ago with another contract zone that was summarily dismissed in the first, oh, yeah. in the first 15 minutes. 
planning yeah. board piled on and that's it was clear. It was clear. It was clear. Yeah. 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 We, we take direction well. Yeah. What I heard from many of you is that there's kernels of, of uh, a really good project here, and so this decision isn't quite as easy, obviously. And so, you know, I would strongly encourage you to keep contract zoning as an option to you. And clearly, um, and I think we've got examples we can point to uh, with, with past contract zones, um, there are ways to develop property uh, and conditions to impose that make a use acceptable. It's not a matter of right or permitted use. And that's the real question I challenge you with, is the sorts of things that they're proposing or the sorts of things that you might add as additional conditions, can it make that use compatible? And that's the real question I think you have to ask yourselves. Yeah. Any words of wisdom, Jay? Uh, I guess the only thing I would offer is I know you know if this matter is before uh, the planning board or scheduled before the planning board this coming Monday, yep. where they'll actually dig into the sort of more technical merits, I guess I call it, of the site plan review provisions and the subdivision provisions. At that time, they won't really be getting into sort of these policy level questions. So I do think you know there is a matter of you know really understanding direction and you know. Um, in terms of the, the time and effort that's going to be put forth by the um, planning board, the public, and the applicant's team as to, you know, you know, I think as Tom said, it sounds like some members have said that there are kernels that might be able to get you there. Um, so we also don't have, have two of your members aren't here tonight, yeah. so right. I don't know exactly where they stand on right. the matter. Uh, I do know there's also a site walk scheduled for yep. this weekend as well. Is that right? Saturday, Saturday, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Yeah, very cold. Do you want to come? I'm too <laughs> <just Saturday. laughs> And I will just also mention site walks. I'll, I'll say it now because probably a bunch of folks will be there. It might be windy. You may not hear me when we're out there on site. Um, but a site walk is really just the opportunity for the planning board to see the site and ask clarifying questions. They're really not going to discuss the merits of the application at that time. That's saved for the, the meeting uh, Monday night. Um, In fact, they're really barred from any right. detailed Kind of you. So do, many, do any of you have questions for us? Are we good? Or did you guys find this useful? Was it Very a, useful. Yeah. Was it useful. Very useful. Well, thank you. I think we had talked about, for anybody, we got some emails about some people not being able to be here for the public comment at 6. So anybody that wasn't here on time, is there anybody that came in late that wants to say anything? Or is everybody good? And seeing it's 9 o'clock, it's <coughs> probably everybody's good. One quick question. Tom, can you give us an idea of the, uh, yeah. Jay, the steps, go forward yeah. steps, and yeah. approximate yeah. timing for the process? So the matter sits with the planning board until they receive or grant a preliminary site plan approval. And at that point, it returns back to the council for final consideration and second reading. Okay. And after council makes its final yeah. reading, it then goes back to planning board for final subdivision approval. Planning board can't take final action until the zoning is in place, and it's the contract okay. zone that puts in place these type of um, uh, changes to the underlying zoning that would permit the board to then take their action. Um, so there's a bit of... So we're on track for this matter coming back before the council sooner than later. Uh, sure it's expected that this will get through on the 14th, uh, but presumably the meeting after that, um, based on the technical merits of the application. I have a question, Jay. If um, rather, if we're going to review this on the 14th, which I think is Monday. <coughs> Does it make sense to postpone that review until the council has the opportunity to yeah. meet and decide whether or not they're going to approve the contract zone? Because right. if they're not going to approve the contract zone, then all the time that we spend on it Monday night and all of these folks that are going to show up on Monday night are going to be wasting their time, right? So the, the process, the regulatory process is spelled out in, in, the, in the ordinance, really talks about the council doing their first reading, at which time they sort of deliberate on some of the merits and, and presumably move it to council if they see there's merit in the applicant, I'm sorry, to planning board if they see that there's merit. Um, and so that's really where we're at. So, I, you know, I, okay. I guess, um, you know, unless we hear otherwise from council that there might be be a need for an additional step, and this was a you know additional step in the process. It's not necessarily spelled out in ordinance, but I think as Tom alluded to earlier, um, 
this type of meeting is the type of meeting that would typically occur if it, but for uh, if it were an original uh, contract yeah. amendment uh, that would sort of so, so on Monday night then, when we're looking at this, are we operating under the assumption that this is going to be your what you'll be reviewing is going to be approved. You'll be reviewing that the the provisions of the site plan review ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. And so you'll be really looking at those typical things you look at in terms of buffering, lighting, stormwater traffic analysis. Um, once you provide that preliminary uh, approval, there's also opportunity for planning board to provide commentary to council on the contract zone. But again, the, the ordinance is very clear that the, the ultimate decision uh, in terms of the contract zone rests with the council. So yes, you, you would proceed as though you know, a 40-foot building is going to be permissible. You would proceed as though 52 units are going to be permissible. The 61-unit sort of question, that's that right now just lies at, in the contract zone in council. That's not before the board. You're only being asked to look at the 52 units. Um, what's the other thing you're being asked? Oh, oh the, uh, the use. The multifamily, the commons building, as it's been referred to, that's a different use than is otherwise allowed in the RF zone. But at this point, the presumption through preliminary approval is that, yes, that is something that's going to be moved forward. Um, and then, ultimately, it does go back to council, and they make amendments, then those will have to be. And I guess that's what I was sort of suggesting, why I mentioned very clearly that there is a second. It does come back to the board. So if it does go to council and there are modifications made, at council during their second reading in approval of the contract zone that I don't even want to make any conjecture what those might be, but if they make any modification to those contract zone allowances, that would come back to the board and you would, you know, address those accordingly because um, you can at only final. approve at final. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. All right. I guess with that, we're... Adjourned, Thank so to speak. Yeah. So moved. Second. Aye. Aye. Aye.